Did you know Goldenrod makes an excellent tea? <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday, dear Aaron. Me. You are a sad, strange little man. You have my pity. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tomic's. <laughs> veteran of the comic book industry for 30 years of a, I'm a writer I'm an artist and uh, this sucks Ladies and gentlemen, here I am, live, coming to you live from the Aaron Lopresti Studios right here in the great, well, not so great, Northwest. It is raining like cats and dogs out there, getting the ark ready to sail, but despite all that, here I am. Um, Boy, have we got a show for you today. And when I say we, I mean me, because Shelly Shelley not only has back issues right now she's dealing with, but now she's got a cold. We were just over at um, my my daughter-in-law's, um, uh, what do you call it? When you have a party for the baby, <laughs> before the baby's born. <laughs> it's just, right out of my ear. Anyway, we were over there for that. And I wasn't actually invited. I was just dropping Shelly off. And then uh, anyway, so she comes home and she goes, you yeah, know, throat's a little scratchy. I'm a little, and then she woke up this morning and she has a cold. So I don't know if it was some of them young people, baby shower. That's what it is. And, uh, or if, uh, you know, she caught it from, I don't know. I don't know. Where is she going that she would catch a cold? Cause I'm not sick. So it's not like I gave it to her. So I don't know. But anyway, it is me solo again, but uh, hope springs eternal that we'll get uh, Shelly mended up and that uh, she'll be back on the show as a regular by the new year, I would hope. Um, anyway, enough about me and my issues and my wife's issues. Let's deal with your issues. Uh, you know, I'd like to say uh, Helder 6480 was the first one here, but it was actually Leg Kick was here last night when I posted this thing. So, uh, so we'll say Leg Kick was the first. Leg Kick is here, of course, because Leg Kick is almost always here. So Helder 6480, you would be second, I guess. Daniel Russell's there. He says, knock, knock. Uh, who's there? I guess we just won't finish that joke. Uh, Mark Pengren is here. Shelly or we riot? Well, let the rioting begin, I'm afraid. Uh, Schism is here. Best wishes to Miss Shelly. Praying for a swift recovery and easy healing. Thank you so much. Uh, Barbara Paulson, best wishes to Shelly. Get well soon. Toshiro's here. Dan, the pizza man, Jen of SC. There's leg kick all the way down there. Uh, Stippling Vaughn, and there he is, folks. The man nominated in six categories for this year's Nobody gives a darn awards. Um, six categories. And you know what I say? I say it's just a thrill just to be nominated. Uh, so anyway, we'll see. Uh, actually, I like to call them the Kenneth Roqueford Awards. So we shall see if any of us can knock Kenneth out of any of his positions of power that he holds. Uh, Eric the Guapo says, I can't believe it. Um, Six categories, and Rini is in seven. Their rivalry is legendary. 
Yeah, she's so good that she's nominated in seven of six categories. That's pretty awesome. Victor, of course, I believe he's referring to me as being a dollar store Alex Ross. And I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. Uh, Paul Brillard, our resident um, engineer, is here. He says, just left the local comic book shop. Throw back to the early 90s shops. Everyone in there was nose blind. Everyone in there was nose blind. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it'll come to me in about five minutes. Um, isn't that funny that a throwback, throwback shop would be the 90s? I know people actually do like dress up days for the 80s now. The 80s is when I was kicking butt. That's when I was in my prime. I was in my tw early, tw uh, graduated high school and was in my 20s going to college. And uh, now it's like, like when I was a kid, we used to dress up and do like 50s day at school. Now people dress up and do 80s day, which I was uh, an integral part of. So feeling a little bit old, I feel like I'm knocking on Art to Bear's door. Uh, let's see. Uh, Randy Hall says happy Guy Fox night. Is it really, is it really Guy Fox day or evening? I have no idea, but I'll take your word for it. Uh, Bill Maxwell is here. H for heretic is here. Uh, he says he's all out of gunpowder though. So I assume he's referring to Guy Fox night. Uh, citizen Ronan is here. Uh, squeaky. It's making an appearance. Uh, I assume Geek Avenger is not far behind. But Squeaky says, hello, everyone. Just sprung from the ICU. Holy crap. I hope you're all right. I assume if they let you go, you are. But, uh, boy, trip to the ICU is no fun. Um, I hope you're doing better, whatever the condition may have been that put you there. Um, prayers and well wishes, of course, to you and the geek. Uh, MPC Oasis, good evening, awesome and wonderful peoples. Of course, we're all awesome and wonderful. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stippling Vaughn says, I had Rini in five categories. So apparently, uh, um, Eric the Guapo is uh, exaggerating a, a wee bit. Marcus Killigrew is here. And of course, we know that Marcus Killigrew is a purveyor of all knowledge, pop culture related. Um, Randy Howell says, Hey, uh, who won Fragtober? Who won Fragtober? Who won Fragtober? Uh, I, you're taught, you're looking at the guy who should have been champion two of the last three years. I just finally officially won it this last year. I do admit last year I got my butt kicked, you know, Malin won last year. I did, I did horrible. I, I just totally choked it. But the year before a little controversial loss by one vote, to Rini, and I kind of think it was fixed. But that's just me. Let's move on. I finally won, so I'll get my belt, and I can uh, put my name amongst the greats that have won um, the Fragtober competition. Uh, let's see. Dan Genovese says, I think Aaron won, but I didn't see it. Dan, yes, I won. I just verified that I won, but why didn't you see it? That's the bigger question. Kel Razor, he's got my back, says, yes, I won. Gears Geek Avenger, I helped Squeaky escape from the ICU today. Q escape music. Um, oh, we're going to get an explanation here. It was a severe, case of, a severe case of sepsis, according to our discharge nurse. Doctor said her recovery was remarkable. This was everybody's prayers that prayed for her. We are lucky to get her, that we got her back. Yes, indeed. Wow. Uh, awesome. I'm glad she's doing better and out of the ICU. Geek, that's tremendous. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sister Rome says Aaron uh, completed his redemption arc. Indeed, I did. Uh, Repairman Jack, where else am I going to be? Ahoy. That's right. If you're not here, where else are you going to be? I don't think anybody's streaming against me today. I think Ethan streamed earlier today. So uh, I should uh, I, I should have a un... Um, how should we say? I was say uninterrupted, but that's not really what I wanted to say. I wanted to say unblocked, unfettered crowd that to, can just freely come here without uh, programming choices to confuse them or make them say, hey, that's a better show than what Aaron's going to give me. Um, Daniel Russell, Aaron, nice job on Frag a third time as a charm or just not have Rini in the field. I fear no one, but it's you guys that vote that I have cause to be concerned about that you may get distracted by other things than the art. That's all I'm saying. Um, John Porton is here. Trader seven. 
Henry Jeremick. Um, Henry, uh, he wants to know, can you please ask Chris Stevens what artists have influenced his style? Am I not the master interviewer, Henry? Do you not trust me at this point that of course I will ask that question, among many others? Uh, I just go right into Kirk, among many others. Uh, Brian Suddenly Old is here. There he is. Um, uh, Kevin Thomas. Duck Bacon has joined us. Um, one Slick Dude is here. Now, I don't bring in my guests until the 30. So 4.30 my time, 7.30 East Coast time, uh, because I do this. And I don't want them to sit there and go, okay, can you quit talking to the chat and do my interview? No, I do this because you guys are of vital importance to the success of this show. So therefore, I spend time with you, just a little one-on-one -on -one time before we bring in the guest. So he'll be here and rolling in about 4.30 or 7.30 East Coast time. Um, that really wasn't a question, but I answered it anyway. Uh, let's see. Paul Taylor's here, our resident biologist. He's probably very excited uh, to see what, what cryptids I have for him in store today. And we do have some strange sightings. So we'll get along to that later in the show, of course. Uh, Heat Miser's here. Wizard Sleeves. Thanks for joining us. Um, hmm. Yeah, Baby Shower. There they are. There we got my... Took me a while to... Uh, you know, the old mind's going. It is. It's it's sad, but true. Um, mm, okay, so now I'm, yeah, I may not have it, but I can be a carrier. Maybe I am a carrier, but uh, as long as I don't have any symptoms, I don't care. No, that's not true. Uh, Robert Doan, Doan's Pills is here. I haven't seen Robert in a bit. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Uh, Shane Davis is sick too. Well, I have not even talked to Shane, uh, so I, you can't blame me for that. Um, Geek Avenger got my wife out of ICU today. God is good, indeed he is. That is great news, Geek Avengers. Thank you for the two dollars. Um, do I have Strange Tales one seventy seven featuring the Golem Frank Booner cover? One of my favorite covers. I do. Didn't I show that last week? No, I think I only showed the one Golem cover. Yes, I do have the Frank Bruner cover. Frank Bruner did some amazing covers in the seventies. Um. Hmm. I don't even know what this means. Lately, all the issues I've been reading are coming from Korea. Jungle Juice is the new X-Men. <laughs> Jungle Juice. Hmm. Uh, let's see here. Uh, old Dirty, there you go. I voted for the Frank. Thank you. I knew, well, Old Dirty Fatty's always in my corner. I appreciate that very much. F in the chat is here. He says that Kenneth is on another level, but he's not unbeatable. He, he, I think he's the best, uh, the best of the C. Do can we even do we even say like CG artists? I mean, is that even really? Um, how would you pray? Uh, he is yes, he's the best of us underneath the CG umbrella that is wide and expansive. Uh, yeah, I love his stuff. Love it. Um, Let's see here. Uh, wizard sleeps as low fat fingered geek. Okay, let's see. Um, sequential treasures in here. Thank you. Hey, there's uh, my second cousin, Kurt Chumslin. Top of your game in the 80s, really? Got to give you crap, cuz. Um, well, you know, Kurt and I hit a few establishments in the, uh, I would have been, well, it might have been late 80s, early 90s. And I remember, I remember there was this blonde chick he was talking to and sort of struck out with. And so I mercilessly made fun of him. And then the very next week, I turned on and did the same thing and struck out with this uh, very attractive brunette. So, uh, yeah, we were, um, we were on the town. We were young. And uh, Kurt probably still has all of his hair, unlike me. But uh, yeah, we, we hit the town for a few weekends there, uh, there in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, let's see here. Uh, Craig Smith is here. What's going on, Aaron? What's going on, Craig? Okay, Paul. Uh, here we go. Paul's going to give us some uh, science. 
The trouble with antibiotics is for decades, doctors were using general antibiotics against everything, and eventually the bugs built up a resistance to them. These mutated bugs are called superbugs. Um, that sounds like a cryptid. Um, yeah, let's see. There you go. Squeaky's looking on the bright side. I have a lot of drawing practice time while I recover. Exactly. Don't let that downtime go unused. Um, yeah, let's see. Killer Kovac says, I saw Lopresti stuff in, stuff mail in ballots before the vote was closed. I know, yeah, I don't need to cheat, okay? Um, hmm. Am I the only one that misses the language alert at the end of the movie jingle? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we haven't done a language alert on this show in a long time. Duck Bacon says, the CG umbrella that is wide and really doesn't have a ring to it. Yeah. Um, wide and encompassing. Uh, let's see. Yes, Frank Brunner did some excellent work on Doctor Strange, both covers and interiors. If you look at the uh, uh, Marvel premiere work he did, as well as, of course, the first couple issues of Doctor Strange. I think the first five, maybe six, and then he was off. But um it's interesting because in Marvel premiere, it started off with Barry Smith. And then I'm going to say there was a Starlin issue in there maybe. And then there was some Plug issues. And then Brunner finally took over. And then they went into uh, uh, Dr. Strange's own series right after that. I, uh, and I'm sure if I'm wrong about that, that uh, <clears throat> um, you guys will correct me. You go, Paul Taylor says, Aaron's not a dem. He doesn't stuff ballot boxes. That is so true. I'm all about honesty and integrity. Uh, Paul, not only did Brunner do hard the duck covers, he did the interiors. Uh, you will find he did the interiors of issues one and two, then Buscema did three, and then Gene Colan took over. Uh, if you look in uh, Giant Size Man Thing, you want to always look in the Giant Size Man Thing, you'll find in issues four and five, that Bruner did two Howard the Duck stories. Uh, one had like this frog, giant frog in it. The other one had the, my favorite was the vampire cow story. So that is sort of the extent of Bruner, Bruner Howard the Duck. Uh, giant size man thing, four and five, and then Howard the Duck, one and two. And he also did a sort of, Gerber tried to get Howard the Duck back from Marvel. Of course it failed. And so they did a book, uh, independent book. Was it through Eclipse? Someone help me out. Uh, it was called The Duckaneer. And it was basically Howard the Duck as a pirate or something. But anyway, and that was Gerber and Bruner as well for an issue or two of that. Um, so there you go. There's the history of Frank Bruner and Howard the Duck. Uh, look at this. Wizard Sleeve says, I'll be backing Kit Carter on my next check. Malin's cut drained me, laugh out loud, but I will get it. I appreciate it. Um, you bought Malin's book instead of mine? I'll recover. I'll be all right. That's all right. I'll be okay. I'll be, okay. Um, I'll be fine. I'll recover from that. Um, look at Paul Taylor. Always the pr practical analysis. He won't read a black and white book, first of all, okay? And now he's saying, I never bought Howard the Duck. It looked dumb. Well, I mean, how old? I mean, Paul, you're probably younger than me. I was like 12 when it came out. How dumb could it look to a 12-year-old? It's a duck smoking a cigar. Come on. I bought it. Although is uh, the first, actually the first two issues, one and two had low distribution. So they were hard to find. I had to actually get those in the secondary market even as a 12 year old. So the book came out and it was not in any of, you know, the seven 11s or uh, convenience stores that I would go to buy comics off the rack. It wasn't there. And so I would have to go to the old bookstores in Portland that would then get these copies of Howard the duck and they'd already marked them up, you know? So then you pay in like five bucks for a 25 cent comic, like less than a month after it came out outrageous but i i got it anyway maybe three bucks but still that's a lot uh you know to mark up a book that's only 25 cents you know less than a month after it came out but that's what was going on man 
low distribution. That's why living on the East Coast, the only reason I'd want to live on the East Coast um, or like the New York area, I used to dream of it. Now I just I dread the idea of it. But that's sort of like the center of comic book universe was in New York and everything went out like this. And of course, me being in the Portland area, I was about as far away as you could get through distribution circles. So if you wanted anything, it was always in New York, it, you'd find it, you know, or in that area. Uh, let's see here. For $4, $4.99, Squibs, thank you so much. He says, Kit Carter is going to be amazing. A Aaron is the best comics gate artist, in my opinion. Um, and it, that's his opinion, not my opinion, although it's pretty much my opinion as well. Um, not really. Well, kind of. Well, you know, we'll let you guys make those decisions. Hey, there's Matt Barr. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Uh, let's see. Nomsky says the Southeast is the place to be, Aaron. Is it though? Is it really? Uh, I'm kind of like, when I was, when I was young and I wanted to break into comics, I wanted to move to New York and I had this this idea that I would become a comic book superstar that I'd make tons of money. Okay. Those, are <laughs> yeah. Right. And then, uh, and then I would buy like, I wanted to buy like an old Victorian mansion in upstate New York. And that was kind of like, you know, what I was going to do. And of course, none of that happened, but um, I did go to New York multiple times and I get to hang out in the Marvel offices back in the old days, or I should say the end of the old days. And, uh, but yeah, my, uh, I think the worst thing you can do is like set up a plan for your life when you're young, because it never goes the way you think it's going to go. I like snow. I just don't like driving in snow. If I don't have to go anyplace, I kind of dig snow. Uh, all right, everybody, let's do this. Um, Kevin Thomas, it happened for Billy Tucci. Yeah, it's like you just wanted to grow up and be Billy Tucci. Well, if only I could have could have had Billy Tucci's hair. I had good hair at one point in my life. You would you wouldn't know it, but I did. Um, uh, let's see here. Let's run a quick public service announcement because um, I would like all of you to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. We're almost at uh, 3,200 subs, but gosh darn, I want to get to four. So uh, help me out if you can. <laughs> I timed that perfectly. I'm very proud of myself. Um, you know, we only have a few minutes before Chris rolls in here. So we better get moving. Uh, enough of this idle chit chat. Let's let's get moving here. Um I did grab some snacks from the baby shower. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. So a little plastic bag. Now these candy covered, they're like M&Ms, peanut M&Ms, except they're all blue because, of course, it's a boy. They say you're not supposed to eat on camera. And they say if you're doing radio, never eat nuts because the skin and stuff gets stuck in the back of your throat. And, and so I'm breaking every broadcast taboo I can think of. Mmm. Tasty. Okay. So as the minutes tick away before Chris joins us, let's look at another great artist. From history, let's take a look at our um, present image for the day.
Frank Frazetta was a groovy artist, man. I'll tell you that. If you look at that real close, it looks like just kind of like a rough, you know, 15 minute sketch or whatever. And it's just brilliant. Brilliant. He always did such a great job of creating weight and volume with his characters. Right. And it just had that old sort of illustration style to it that I just really love. Um, anyway, just more Frank and more Frank is always a good thing. Um, <laughs> Angela Curry, <laughs> that's copyright free. Well, yeah, that's because, especially as kids, you do the, the cardinal sin, right? So it was never judge a book by a cover, but that's all we ever did was buy books because Frazetta did the cover. Um, hmm. Indeed it was. Michael D. Shh, Frazetta captured my imagination as a kid. Mine too. I always talk about, I always talk about Wrightson, but Frazetta, Frazetta was the guy that got me going as a really, really young kid. And um, I didn't discover rights until I was probably 12, 11 or 12. But Wrightson was there, you know, since the first time I went to a bookstore and saw the paperback section on the wall, you know, you used to have those racks with the paperbacks on them and all those Conan books. And then things like the mucker, this Burroughs stuff, you know, and oh, great times. I used to, I told this before, but we, my parents would go to the mall, right? And malls were a relatively new thing when I was a kid. And I would just have them leave me in the bookstore and they would just go do their shopping. And I would stay in the bookstore for a half hour, an hour, however long they were gone, you know, shopping through the mall and they would come and get me. And then I wouldn't want to leave when they came and got me. Uh, speaking of books, Wraith of God Blood Hunters is supposed to be supposed to be done at the printers. Uh, they said November 7th. So that's uh, Tuesday. And then it's supposed to ship out to me. Now, how long they'll take to get to me? Three days, maybe. Uh, so I'm hoping to have all the books by the end of the week and then start shipping them out. Now, some of you may have seen this because I showed this, I think I showed it someplace. Um, I got these last week on Monday, I think. Now, this is this is actual the printed cover. It's just not folded. All right. So you can see the writing on the oops, sorry. The writing on the spine. You see, it says number two, Wraith of God Blood Hunters, Aaron Lopresti. That would be me. And then we have down here the little uh Empire logo, very little, and it says Empire Comics. So that's the spine, right? This is the wrap. <laughs> There it is. Uh, that's the wraparound cover. And this is on that um, matte finish paper that I did the first book on. And a lot of people said, oh, that's really cool, Aaron. It feels like leather or something. It's really suitable for a Western. But uh, it, you know what the great thing about this stuff is? You're not leaving fingerprints on it like you do the glossy. And that's why I never get the gloss because I hate that. You know, uh, we have to take the books and put them in bags and boards. And you don't want my fingerprints on them any more than you want your fingerprints on them. And this is very fingerprint resistant. So anyway, so that's the wraparound. This, of course, is the Tales of Suspense cover. Um, now, you'll see that as a UPC code on it. This one doesn't because I didn't want to cover up the, the Dick Ayers tombstone right here with it. So I left it off. But the uh, IBC, the IBSN number is on the inside anyway. So, but anyway, so there's the little thing on there. And then um, I see there's Chris in the back room. I'll be right with you, Chris. Uh, there is the uh, the third cover. That's the Tomb of Dracula number one tribute. And of course, this is the back cover again. And then where do we got here? There it is. There's the old Bisley. So, yes, yeah, so I should have these by the end of this week, and I'm going to be shipping them out to you. But these are actually printed covers taken off the assembly line before they bound anything, just for me to check. And um, I also got the uh, unstitched guts. 
to the book, all 108 pages right here. So I could go through and, you know, find any last minute mistakes that it's too late to correct anyway. But uh, so anyway, there they are. So that book does exist. Wraith of God Ruffs, Volume 2. All those layouts and stuff right in there. It's all these are all signed and numbered as well. So all that stuff is coming your way very, very shortly. But you know what's coming your way right now? Right this second. I have a special guest. He's a guy that uh, I've known for years over the internet, but we'd never actually met face to face. I guess we still haven't because you can't really consider the internet face to face, but we did talk face to face a couple days ago to make sure the connection was all right and everything was working. Uh, but he's I'm just a huge fan of his work. I have been for ages. Uh, I got him to do uh, one of the covers for the Kit Carter uh, campaign, which we'll take a look at shortly, along with a lot of his other work. But please, everybody, welcome cover artist and illustrator extraordinaire, Chris Stevens. Hey, Chris. Hey. Can look you at hear that. Me? I can hear you. You're well lit. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're ready to go. Uh, hey, thanks for joining me, man. I appreciate it. I wanted to get an interview with you, talk to you, find out, uh, you know, your humble beginnings and your process of your art and everything. So we're going to delve deep into that tonight. But thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. I have no problem, man. I'm glad we did the test because we're actually ready this time. Yeah. <laughs> we had we had a little bit of trouble finding the right computer uh, hookup for Chris, but it... Uh, it, uh, it all works now, so we're good. Um, all right, Chris. Now, for those of you that don't know who Chris is, I would encourage you to check out his Instagram page. There's a link in the description of this video. And um, get over there and take a look at some of his tremendous work. Now, Chris, I first was introduced to you, or at least to your work, through uh, Tim Townsend, anchor of X-Men and many other things, great anchor. Um like in the early 2000s, probably uh, when I was still at CrossGen in Florida, because I was a, I was actually went over to his house in um, uh, when he was living in Florida. I don't know if he's still there or not, but he, uh, he is. Yeah, we were we're sitting in his room in his uh, studio and he he had I remember he had all these glass cases surrounding him in his entire studio and they're all just full of statues. It was crazy. But then he pulls out this stack of drawings and he says, check this guy out. And it was your stuff. And I was just blown away. And I'm like, who is this guy? And uh, later, I just I found your work. You brought this up when we were talking uh, two nights ago that, you know, we started sort of connecting over DeviantArt, you know, yeah. and see your art. And I went, oh, that's the guy that uh, Tim Townsend told me about. And, you know, and then we started kind of exchanging uh, pleasantries about each other's art and um, just kind of went from there. But I want to ask you now, so were you, first of all, were you a comics fan growing up as a kid? Is it something you got into later or what was your interest in comics growing up? Um, yeah, it was 85 when I first got into comics. I was nine, at nine years old. Okay. And I had a, a friend who lived across the street who was really big and he got me into it. And I started, uh, I got one of those starter kits that Sears used to sell. Mm-hmm. They would give you two issues of every title. And uh, so I got, I, I, it was like a, a collection in a box pretty much. You know, I got started with that and uh, became a big, big comic book fan after that. And uh, very much skewed to Marvel, you know, it, it, for most of that time. Yeah, I was a Marvel <clears throat> zombie too. I remember, <laughs> those, <laughs> do people even know what Sears is anymore? I used to work at Montgomery <laughs> Wards when I was in uh, like that, 19. Yeah. They may not know what that is. They may, may have heard of Sears, but Montgomery Ward, that's a, that's a deeper cut. Um, yeah. Did you have any books that, that were sort of like your, you know, your favorite thing that you had to make sure you, you got to read every month or however often you could get the books? Yeah, at first, not, not so much. I, I kind of want, I was like all over the place. I was buying everything. I didn't really mm -hmm. have, a, I didn't know the stories or characters that well. So I kind of, I, I bought based on the art more than anything else. Um, but uh, eventually I did start reading Spider-Man a lot. And uh, I fell in love with Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends' Thor. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that was like the late nineties, early or late eighties, yeah. early eighties, somewhere yeah. around there. And uh, that was probably one of the first books I really got invested in and just read that a ton. Um, and, uh, then of course it was like, it became the art explosion of the early nineties with Jim Lee and anything McFarland did. I had to have all that kind of stuff. You know, it, it, yep. it, it didn't take long before art became the, the priority in every, in all of it, you know, I would buy anything right. like the artwork. <laughs> so yeah, I, I wasn't as loyal to story and character as much, you know, it just always became an art thing. Yeah. I, I was, even at a young age, I was sort of drawn. I wouldn't necessarily buy a book if I didn't like the artwork. I mean, I would, if I was like, I was a Captain America fan and I was never, I never really got into Frank Robbins. And when he was drawing Captain America, and this is in the seventies, so I'm about 10 years older than you. Yeah. And, I like couldn't stick with Captain America because I couldn't stand Frank Robbins art. And I know that's kind of sacrilege to some people, but at the time I just, you know, was, I just didn't get it. And uh, so I was always looking at stuff that I liked the way it looked, you yeah. know, yeah. and then that would grab, then I would gravitate towards that and buy the character, except for monster books. And I pretty much would buy a monster book regardless, but. Um, they, were almost, they were almost always well drawn though. They've got a lot of great that's artists true. working on monster stuff. Yeah, that so, usually ends up being the case. Um, Robbins was definitely uh, somebody I, I felt the same way when I was a kid. Like I hated his art. If I bought Invaders, I'd buy Invaders. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, God, why is this guy working for Marvel? You know, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, just, it was so funky looking. And it was like, what is happening here? But then, you know, years later, I would look open those books up and it would suddenly I was just like I had a newfound appreciation for just how different and unique his stuff was. Right. But, it, you know, he drew some funky looking characters, man. Like, it was, <laughs> yeah, yeah those big funny. eyes and the rubbery anatomy. And I was just like, I yeah. just never really got it. But uh, I did um, Geek Avengers for two dollars says Aaron goes for the Yul Brenner look these days, I guess, because he caught me when I pulled my cap off <laughs> and uh, got I'm, a little. I'm, get, I'm getting there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. Randy Howell says, was that a Viagra pill? Now he's talking about I had these. I stole some, um, we had a baby shower uh, for my daughter-in-law yesterday, and uh, I had one of these earlier in the show, and it's basically a candy-coated, chocolate-covered uh, almond, and um, so I, I guess that was... that's what he's referring to if I was taking Viagra, and no, I'm not Randy Howell, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're not swallowing a pill that big. No, I, I chew it up first, it's flavored, <laughs> so... Um, Okay, so uh, let me get rid of that. All right. So, have you? Are were you one of those kids that were? I mean, I was drawing pre kindergarten. I always had a pencil in my hand. Was always drawing. Are you? Were you like that, or is it something you kind of got into maybe when you were a little older, or what was your first? Yeah, I was the same. I was very okay. much. The same. I remember winning drawing competitions in the first grade. You know, and. It was just my stick figures were a little better than my, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how they noticed any talent at that age, but it seemed like from the very beginning, I was being kind of singled out as the artist in class. I'm not even sure mm -hmm. how that happened. And um, yeah, before comic books, it was um, Garfield. You know, I would draw a lot of Garfield stuff mm -hmm. and um, just obsessively trying to do the, the Jim Davis Garfield look and, failing over it. I mean, I, it was, <laughs> I still can't do it, you know, like, it, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, that, it was always an early on thing. And I think I got before, even before comic books, I got a, a how to draw superheroes book or something. It was a DC thing. Mm -hmm. I think it was like Jose Luis Garcia Lopez art in it. Yeah. Nice. He, he was the template, right. You know, like right. he, he was what you based all your DC stuff on back then. And I remember tracing Batman and things and trying to figure that out before I even started doing comic book stuff. So it was that was it was already starting to kind of get ingrained in me that I wanted to draw superhero stuff. But yeah, I, always the artist in class and and um, yeah, I I started off <laughs> I started off mimicking animation, right? Like Flintstones and Popeye and that kind of thing. And then it wasn't when I was I don't know. And or so I discovered comic books and then it was just all superheroes from then on out. You know, it was like, I wanted to be a comic book artist. That's all I ever thought about doing. Um, yeah. Was, did you end up going to school for art at all? Or were you self-taught? 
Um, I consider myself self-taught because I, I did go to uh, Savannah College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. they, have a, they have a sequential art program. Right. And the plan was to go there and do a full program there. But um, I, I didn't stay very long. I stayed about, I think I did a full year. And then I just said, uh, I don't think this is going to help me long term. Like a, I, was at a, I was at a portfolio review. I was at a portfolio review and there was a senior there showing his portfolio to somebody like to what to like a guest. They had some cool guests like Jack Davis was there one time. They had some really nice, really nice guests sometimes. And he was showing his portfolio. This was a guy who did four years and put, I don't even know how many thousands of dollars into his education and his stuff looked bad. Like even at that mm -hmm. point, I could tell it wasn't good. It was like, it wasn't, he wasn't going to get anything with his portfolio. And, I thought, man, if that's what four years gets you, you know, uh, I think I need to maybe rethink, rethink all this because I can learn some stuff. I have no doubt, but I might be just as productive simply by really focusing all my effort on just trying to create a, 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 a good work, a good portfolio, anything. I mean, I was, I was about 20 at the time and, um, you know, I, I just, I, came to the realization that, you know, comics is not probably not going to make me a lot of money. <laughs> and, you know, spending, we spending, all learned that lesson, didn't we? <laughs> spending the kind of time and money that it would take to, to do that, that degree at Savannah. I was like, man, I think, I think I'm just going to do what my heroes did, you know, and just kind of figure it out. You know, um, I've seen, you know, I've seen, Coming from that college, I have seen portfolios of students that have graduated and, and I was like, wow, how in debt are you? You know, and it's like, because I, I mean, I honestly believe that we're all sort of born with talent and it's kind of like you, you develop it or you don't, but if you, if you're not born with artistic talent, you can go to school until you're blue in the face and it's not going to make you a great artist, Right. And when you have to start looking at the amount of money, like you said, you're putting into a college education, you're wondering, what am I actually, I mean, that was very intuitive of you and very uh, wise at your age, you know, to make that sort of rec decision and go, wow, I'm not going to waste, you know, 20 grand a year or whatever it was at the time, you know, uh, yeah. doing this. So what was your, what was your first uh, paid gig? What, how did, what was your, would you consider your first professional job and how'd you get it? Um, it was uh, a company called White Wolf. Okay. They do uh, role, pen and paper role-playing games and they do, they're best known for like Vampire, The Masquerade and. Um, um, Take your word for it. Draw a blank. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was, uh, working on a portfolio to do comics. And I met a guy at a show, he was an artist guest and he was working on stuff for an RPG company. Mm -hmm. And he looked, I showed him some of my stuff and he's like, you know, it, you know, you might want to send some stuff to these guys because they're not very picky, you know, like they're <laughs> <laughs> like a left-handed compliment or something. <laughs> well, I, I mean, at the time I, I understood, like I was not, I right. was not ready for the, for the big leagues. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said, you know, okay, you know, I, I, I just wanted to get money to draw. That was the main goal at that point. So I submitted a bunch of portfolios, just mailed them out. Like this was back before internet stuff, really. And, and this was 99. Internet was around, but it was still kind of snail mail stuff or like a yeah. dial up and everything. So a lot, right. of stuff was, a lot of stuff was still done through the mail. So I sent a bunch of portfolios out and uh, surprisingly I got, uh, a call from a guy at White Wolf who was, they were starting a new line and just so happens they thought my style would fit. And uh, yeah, that was my, that was my first job. And I did uh, full page spot illustrations in, in one of their exalted books. And um, it was just, I was doing, I was doing marker. Like I, even back then I was doing marker mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was black and white. It was printed in black and white. And uh, I was super nervous and, uh, and uh, put everything I had into it and um, it, it, more work. And I, I worked for them for several more years after that. And uh, before I even really thought about trying to get into comics in any way, I, I, I stuck with RPG work for a long time. I never felt ready. I still don't feel ready. 
<laughs> well, you're you're ready, Chris. Let me give you your, the uh, your the stamp of approval. Um, uh, I'm going to bring up uh, some of your artwork, and we're going to talk about it. I, I do want to ask you here before we get going on that. Do you have any like particular artists you would you would mark as your main influences uh, that helped you kind of develop your own style? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, probably the two the two guys um, the had the biggest impact on the way my stuff looks is uh, Travis Chere or Travis Cherist. I was gonna say I I was wondering because I can see a, especially in your black and white work I I can see that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, Bernie Wrightson. Um, Wrightson, look at that. You and me, we're both Wrightson honks. How about that? Right. I could definitely see it in your stuff. I mean, it might. Be, I don't know if you could see it in mine at all. It's it's certainly kind of gotten a little hidden over the years. Like it used mm -hmm. to be a lot more obvious, and I've kind of hidden it more over time as my stuff style kind of changes. But yeah, like he was Bernie was like the the guy who uh, I, I saw his. Uh, book uh, a, a look back and just mm -hmm. it yep. became my, it became my bible like this is Dude, me too look at this you, is you new, me, man. This is, yeah like, hang this, out. Is, this is the new standard of what comic art sh could look like and should look like like this this level is like i had never seen anything like that before and mm -hmm. i haven't really seen anything since like that you know it's it's just a different kind of level of of quality of artistry of you know of eye and vision and everything that he had. And, and that's when I really started obsessing over lines, you know, like really obsessing over different line weights and hatching and cross hatching and how, how mm -hmm. to create shadows and highlights and depth and all the things that I just, that kind of light bulb thing when I saw his stuff, like, mm -hmm. whoa. Um, so yeah, well, those well, are, those are two I probably attribute the most. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when I looked back, they were advertising for it. I saw it in the Buyer's Guide, which is the weekly newspaper, you know, that used to come out with all the comic info on it. And uh, I think it was 79. Uh, and they had like, uh, it was like sort of like the uh, precursor to crowdfunding. They had a little, they, uh, Christopher Zavisa, who published it, was had this double page ad in the Buyer's Guide and a little coupon down there where you could like order the copy and send in your check, right? <laughs> And, um, so I, I got the, being a collector, like I always am, I had to get the, uh, the, the signed numbered edition, right. It was like 125 bucks or something. And, uh, so was that a hardcover or a, yeah, it was the hardcover, but it had like a, it had like a, a color plate, uh, David Williams is calling me. He always messes with me when I'm doing, <laughs> trying to do a show. Uh, anyway, so it had like the color, uh, tipped in color plate. It was like a vampire pulling a, a stake out of his heart, you know, and he had somebody by right. the collar and th that was like glued into the front inside front cover and it was signed and numbered by Wrightson. Oh. And, uh, so yeah, right. I remember just anxiously awaiting for that box from UPS to, to show up, you know, cause it was months later cause I, we, we bought it. I paid for it way before it came out. You know, they were still in production and, and, uh, that book, I wore that thing out, uh, just yeah. tremendous, but okay. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's take a look at some pieces here. I'm going to, I'm going to go black and white, then look at your grayscale stuff then look at your color stuff. Um, okay. so I pulled a few examples of each here. Hopefully it's not anything too old that I'll cringe when I say well, I, <laughs> I went and picked the pieces I liked. So regardless of how old they are, you got my stamp of approval on it. So, uh, yeah, there it is. David Williams says, what's up, King Chris? Hey, bro with a mo. Yeah, and he's like, answer me, A.A. <laughs> a. Ron. See, see <laughs> I, can't, I can't like interview somebody while I'm talking to you on the phone, David. Jesus, <laughs> he does this to me all the time. Um, okay. He's always been so, so kind and supportive. I mean, for years, he's been the best, like just giving me all kinds of nice compliments. And I always appreciate it because his stuff is such a high level. Yeah, he's really good. And uh, he can be really annoying, though. That's the thing. About David. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, he is a great guy and a great artist. Um, OK, so 
this is getting a little soft here when I blow it up, but oh, yeah. is this all pen? Do you have any brush in here? What kind of pens are you using? I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a micron guy. Okay. Uh, That's what I thought. Yeah. Just a micron a user. Uh, I, I did. I mean, there's been, I've tried everything over the years as far as like different tools to ink. None of that ever felt right. Like I just I always felt like I was struggling to get what I wanted out of those. And then, of course, over time, my style has gotten so intricate and like ridiculous that mm -hmm. I've I've gotten to the point now where it's like I have to have like a really fine tip to do certain things. Right. And um, so I've gotten to where I just I really feel comfortable and confident when I'm just using a, a beat up double oh five micron to do some of these really really fine lines in sculpting five and that's tiny yeah it's the smallest one it's uh, actually there's a double of three that they started making not too long ago um which is even finer but i don't i don't use that one too much because it's uh it doesn't hold it doesn't hold its shape as well for some reason <clears throat> but uh yeah it's pretty if you Pretty much anything you've seen of mine or you, anything you'll probably pull up is going to be all micron with uh, maybe uh, – no, I probably used micron brush pens to do the fill-ins too. So, Okay, I was going to ask you, you're filling in your blacks with brush pens. Now, what yeah. about some of these – like you see right here on her, on her boot here, these thicker lines here. Are you, None of this is brush. This is all pen? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've gotten pretty – pretty good at sculpting lines or, you know, like adding, doing a hatch and then going back in and thickening up the base. So it looks like a, a sculpted line or like a, a shaped line, kind of like a brush. It's kind of like m mimicking <laughs> the, the look of, that I'm going for with like a brush line. It's yeah, so, I, it, I have, some of the stuff is so um, tedious and meticulous. It's like, you have to really be patient to work like this. Um, so I'm going to assume that's like part of your personality, right? That you, you have the ability to sit yeah. there and just well, do these on, lines and do them perfectly. Yeah. That that's when I'm happiest is when I'm, when you zoom in on a knee and you see a bunch of folds with like a million lines, that's, that's me in my most comfortable place. If I'm, you know, or you, you look at the intricacy on that head there, it's, mm -hmm. that's when I'm, most satisfied as an artist is when I'm in there trying to do that kind of stuff. And that's definitely a, a, a Travis Charest kind of right. obsession, obsession to, to detail line and, and trying to get everything perfect. And I, I don't think I've ever been as bad as him as far as like the amount of effort and time he would put into everything. I, I don't think I was that, I don't think I was that bad, but it, you know, I, I still feel that need to do that stuff. And that's the stuff that I enjoy the most. And it's the stuff I like looking at the most. I just, anybody's work, I, I zoom in, I, I, I kind of focus in on those areas and really look at them because that's the, that's the fun stuff to me. And, uh, you know, were, were you always like this, even younger, um, kind of meticulous or did, is this something you sort of like, like you saw Travis's work or some other people that are like right since Frankenstein and you're like going, Oh, yeah. I want to, I want to try some of that. And then you got into it or have you, do you think you've always been sort of a noodler and uh, meticulous yeah. and it, it, yeah, it, I don't think it, I don't think I started like that. No, I, like in the early days, it was John Buscema, you know, I, I, yeah. Wanted, yeah. I, I wanted to be like that guy. And uh, I wasn't really thinking much about style specifically. It was just kind of trying to draw cool, really good characters, you know, and the way he could. And then McFarlane came along and, and showed me that you, style can actually be cooler than just being good at drawing like you know right mcfarland broke every rule as far as drawing goes you know like none yeah. of this stuff was drawn properly but it's it's it was awesome because it he did all those things that just made you want to look at it and uh well that's the thing that it took me took me a long time to understand was that style is probably the most important thing in comic book art because you want to get yeah. you want to get an immediate visceral reaction from your audience and the more stylized you are the more um shall we say uh, off the beaten path you grab people's attention immediately you know so if you're doing like you said stylized hair that doesn't really look like hair it looks more like a shape or a design element 
Yeah. Those are things that are really interesting that a lot of people don't necessarily do, or at least yeah. um, they yeah. probably more of it's going on now. Um, yeah. Over, over the years, I've, I've, I've stopped caring about whether or not things make sense. Like if I'm doing right. Something, if the lighting doesn't look right or doesn't make sense, I'm like, well, if it, it looks cool, so I'm just going to go with it. Like, I'm just going to let, let it be whatever it, it is. It looks, it looks good. Like, I don't, I just don't care, you know? And, you know, so I do a lot of things that I have multiple light sources and, and do, and do things that may not be consistent, but I do it purely for the overall look, you know, I just, and I try right. really not to just, just not worry about, you know, rules and, things that I used to care about it a lot more. Right. I, I think that, you know, it's the old saying, right? You, you got to learn the rules for you can break them, but yeah. there's, there is again, when you, especially when you're talking about fantasy art or comic book art, um, looking cool is so important and it's more important than necessarily being correct. Right. Right. Uh, by mm -hmm. correct, by definition of, you know, what an art school, you know, definition of anatomy and all this kind of stuff stylization becomes a really big deal and it can, it can separate you from other artists. Um, I want to say, Hey, real quickly, uh, John Malin's in there uh, in the audience says, Hey, love, loves your stuff. Uh, oh, we got, thank you, John. Um, a lot of guys are, uh, everybody's just too. <laughs> loving what you're, you got, you got, you're putting, we're looking at here. Um, I was going to say, if David wanted to talk, David, let me know in the chat and I'll send you a link if you want to come in here and uh, chat with Chris as well. I don't know. He may not want to, but uh, <laughs> he just no, wants to call. He just wants to call on the phone and, uh, you know, disrupt everything. But um, <laughs> I love this piece. Thank you. Um, so are, are most is this a cover or is this a commission? That's a commission. OK. That's for Felix, my uh, art rep. Felix Blue. Um, those art reps, man, they get all the money and then they're like, Hey, do my commission. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's the, he's been great though. I, I love Felix. He's been like just the best for me. I noticed, uh, I went to the, to his, uh, site and all the art that's listed for you is all sold out. Yeah. Every piece. Yeah. I think he uses it as a portfolio of what you could get if you got on my list. <laughs> it's like, can't have this. It's already gone. <laughs> Here's a, here's a whole bunch. Yeah. Here's a whole bunch of examples of what you might get something like, you know, uh, uh David has a question for you. I got a question for King Chris. What is the average time for your color commissions? Save that. Cause we'll get to your color. I was going to ask you that when we get there, but we're not quite there yet. Um, I want to take a look at, cause the first stuff I saw from you was actually not your pen and ink stuff, but your gray. Yeah. Uh, total stuff. Yeah. Um, now, yeah, the the gray stuff is kind of what got me started. Like I, you know, the first kind of big light bulb thing that I had was with grayscale markers and uh, a process that I was doing that seemed like common sense to me. Like it's the only way I could do it. And everybody's like, well, how are you doing that? What are you doing? And it's when I started getting those questions, I started thinking, well, maybe I'm onto something here because this is the only way I could, I know how to do this, but everyone's baffled by how I do it. You know? So, so this is, this is marker. This is, there's no, there's no paint in here. Is there a little acrylic for highlights or is it all marker? Um, if I, if I'm not mistaken, this has paint in it. Um, okay. yeah, it does. It does have paint. Um, it would have been, yeah, this is not, yeah. Right by this there. point I was, by this point I was using watercolor as a, as a, rendering tool so i would do like a, a base marker and then i would paint my white highlight details on there and then i would do mm -hmm. another sometimes i would do another layer of marker on top of that um so this is mostly marker with a little bit of watercolor then yeah at this time i, I didn't do a ton of marker of, of paint render but there's a fair bit here this is uh this was probably like 20 20 14 maybe somewhere around there well i can tell right here this is a cool gray right there and then this is your neutral gray so i that's what kind of clued me in that oh he's using markers because i could tell the difference yeah you know in the warm grays and the neutrals and then the cool grays um yeah, yeah. having used them myself but i i kept looking at some of this stuff like in here uh and it feels like paint you know so that's why i was kind of wasn't 100 percent sure that this was all marker 
Um, what what kind of paper are you using when you're doing this on? Strathmore Bristol. Uh, at this time, I might have still been using Smooth, but I eventually switched over to the uh, the vellum. To get a little more uh, texture in it? A little more, yeah, because I was painting a lot more, and I wanted, mm -hmm. more, uh, wanted more of a tooth. But, um, yeah, you know, the cool thing about grayscale, of course, is that you've got 10 shades to work with. You know, like with color, you might have two greens or whatever, and you have to try to blend those in and try to work with it and stuff. And with a gray, you can just, you can do anything. You can do the most subtle shading. You can do like really good poppy contrasty stuff, or you can really create some soft, soft tones and transitions. And, yeah. uh, you know, like by this point I had been doing grayscale for a pretty long time. And, uh, do you ever, uh, do you ever like spray any, um, any sort of, uh, covering over this when, as you layer up? So I was watching David Finch, you know, on a video and he was, they would lay down acrylic, then they go over with, and then they they coat it with um like a acrylic uh um I don't want to say a primer, but uh transparent acrylic uh coating, and then they would then they'd colored pencil over the top of that because it created a a nicer surface to do the colored pencil work, and then they'd spray that and then they'd go over it again. <laughs> um do you do any of that uh, layering when you're when this kind of stuff are you just building up over the same surface? No, I, no, there's no real, I don't have any real interesting techniques in my process. It's, it's okay. in this case, it was just, I'm just laying stuff down. Like I'll slap down a, a base kind of gray for his body. I won't do much rendering. I'll just kind of do a base gray. And then when I, I go and paint, do all that deep detail. And then the second layer of markers, when I do all of my real rendering and, um, and that's kind of what I do with acrylic too. Acrylic is, um, just, I just go in. I, you know, I don't really have a, I don't really have an involved process for that or of, of anything. I just, uh, you just, you just start going until you're finished. I <laughs> just start going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So this, so this is what I was talking about. See, I can see your warm grays are in here. Yeah. Right. And then you've yeah. got uh, some cooler grays. That's this stuff leaning into the blue. Um, so again, so this is all marker when you're using, and then I see you've got like some spot white here that looks like you went in with acrylic with a brush or something, right? To highlight that. Yeah. Yeah. This was, uh, towards the very end of my grayscale days. Um, so this was about as, about as good and efficient as I ever got doing grayscale work because right, not too long after this, I started doing, doing color work and, uh, sticking with that. And yeah, um, I was. I, I was wondering, I was going to ask you, because one of the tricks, of course, to color painting is once you control your values, the, the, the painting, the color becomes much easier. And I, I was wondering if you, did you, were you doing all this gray marker stuff to get a grip on values and how you'd control values before you jumped into color or is it, or yeah. is that a part of your thought process? No, it was really just me being afraid of color. Like, uh, no. <laughs> we all are. I had, I had, I had absolutely no clue about color and it just, anytime I saw color work, I knew if it was good or bad, but I had no idea why, you know, I could look right. at it and just be like, that's really good. But I, I couldn't tell you why. And that's really bad, but I don't understand why it's bad. Mm -hmm. And then with my work, when I went to do color, it was like, I just, I had no idea how to, how to approach it. So I was really intimidated by the idea and I put it off for a really long time because I felt so comfortable with, with grayscale. And especially by the end, by the, by the time I was doing stuff like this, I felt like I had really gotten to the point where I was really comfortable with my, my understanding of value and, and how to kind of take, take advantage of that. And, yeah. uh, and I, and I was so known for it for a, a good while too, that I was afraid to do color and, and have people go, Oh, Whoa, that's a, uh, go back to, go back to great. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what happened? Man? <laughs> <laughs> um, Corin Kaiser stone is in the, or I should say Corin Kaiser stone is in the audience here. He's a animation uh, designer. He's a big fan of your stuff as well. Chris, I don't know. Do you know him or, you know, his work on Instagram? 
I don't think so. I'm, I'm not sure. I bet, saw it. I bet if you saw it, you know, he was on Greybeards with us once. Uh, he's well, thank you terrific for stuff. It. So check him out on Instagram, Chris. All right. I, will do. Um, I follow a lot of people, a lot of animators too. So I, I'll definitely check it out. Okay. So let me ask you a question, just real specific here on these folds right here. Mm -hmm. um, did you, did you go in here? Was he, are these full of cross hatching in the inking stage? And then you markered over them or did you just leave them open and fill them uh, with the grays as you use the marker? Yeah. In those days I didn't do any line hat line work. So, oh, okay. So you just created shapes and pretty much filled them in with a marker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, it was a lot easier. It's, it's pretty easy to do with grayscale uh, in terms of like all the subtlety ranges you can get there and all those nice blends. But yeah, I, it was, it took me a while to rip, to start inking on uh, these, these pieces and, and getting to the point where the process just got more and more involved. But yeah, when, at, this, at this stage it was all marker. Okay. So like, did you, you delineated these, shapes though with line right and then yeah. but you just didn't and then yeah. you, you did your shading with your markers but all this was essentially right. i mean i can see here this is just this is a marker shape here but there's these, a lot of yeah there's a lot of line support going on right we're all right. going in some back then i would use a pencil and i would just kind of add a little bit of a, an outline on certain shapes i still do that today where i'll just add a, a little bit of an outline on, on shapes and folds and things like that um and there's a lot of there's a lot of lines there, but there's not like there's no there's no like inking in terms of like cross hatching and shadows and stuff that I'm making. Right, that. right. But, You're just but all of it, all of it's yeah. There's lines. I, I outline everything, and I I go in and outline or kind of outline the folds. And if you could see if this was higher res, you could zoom in and see me outlining all kinds of stuff with with a, probably a pencil at the time. Mm -hmm. Now this stuff, really subtle stuff, this stuff going on back here, you got to be laying that in with a brush, or am I mistaken? Is this uh, like, uh, like yeah. pro white or acrylic? This it's kind of weird, spotty looking stuff. Yeah, it's pro white. Um, probably a couple of layers of just kind of splotching it down, mm -hmm. and now and then I go back over it with marker to kind of darken it to kind of give it a little yeah. more shading, a little more subtlety, and um, that's so you. That's the whole piece. <laughs> so you really do just kind of go for it. And, you know, whenever you're done, you're done. You don't have a, uh, <laughs> a sort of a systematic process necessarily. Right. I mean, is that, I am, I am pulling all of this out of my ass. Unfortunately, it's, uh, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I have, I, I have like a, I, I barely do a rough. It's uh, a, <laughs> a, it, I'm pretty bad about it. Like I don't, I don't plan this stuff very well. And and there's been a many, so many times where I've hated myself for doing it that way because it's I'll, I'll really get in trouble on pieces right. that I just didn't think it through. And then I'm almost, you know, I'm really deep into it, and I realize I've just made twelve bad decisions. And uh, <laughs> you gotta I, go fix it's something. Too it's too late. It's, <laughs> it's so funny because I do the same thing, and I keep thinking like. You know, if Alex Ross, Alex Ross probably is a system, you know, and I'm just like going all over the place and not thinking stuff through. And then you get yourself in trouble. And uh, yeah. David, of course, says, I repeat, Chris, I hate you. Um, <laughs> he says, every freaking time I go to this man's Instagram, I lose hours. It is. It is. Yeah, it's like you go down this rabbit hole of uh, Chris's artwork. And uh, David wanted to know uh, also, what was your annual budget on Copics? You know, uh, it was, uh, uh, <laughs> I, Tim, uh, Townsend was the one who informed me that you could refill those things. I was throwing them away when, uh, they got empty and I had no clue that you could refill them. And he's like, you know, you can refill those. Right. And I'm like, Oh, but, you know, well, the, for years, in fact, this piece was probably one of them. Uh, I used Prismacolor grayscale markers because I liked the, uh, the chisel tips they had where I just thought, thought a lot better than Copic. Right. So I, so I did all my grayscale pieces with Prismacolor and um, oh, nice. then I, those, those are disposable. So I went through a million of those. It must be a landfill somewhere with all my markers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, eventually I just said, man, I, I need to switch over to Copic because it it's costing so much money to go through these things. And um, you know, 
at first it, it seemed like I had struck gold because I, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, is this, is this too old? Is this too old for you? First Margaret pieces I ever posted on uh, the internet. Oh, but it's so <laughs> cool. Look uh, at, uh, is this, is this, did you use white pencil in here on the chest and those highlights? White pencil, yeah. That was before I was really painting. So that, that's pretty much just uh, a couple of like one layer of marker. And then I went back in and did a ton of like rendering with white color pencil. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I used to do the watercolors. I would do the watercolor, but I was not too sure of my watercoloring. Right. So you'd kind of get your base watercolor. Then you'd go in with colored pencils, like, and render the crap out of it. So you couldn't tell how splotchy the watercolor was. Right? It was a great way. Yeah, uh, because I think it's easier for us because we're you if you draw a lot, you're used to using a pencil. And so it's like you feel more comfortable slowly, like building up. At least I do building yeah. up color and stuff with a colored pencil because I have more control over it. You know, yeah, it's it's all about the control there. I mean, I, I feel that way with with the the, the what you call it, the uh, the white, the watercolor paint now. I feel yeah. really comfortable with that now. Like it, it feels as good as ever, a pencil ever did. But in those days, it was just I, I, I was afraid of brushes. So it was it was all about a pencil, whatever I could kind of when anything I could do to kind of use that that process. So I would I would basically like that glove there. I would fill it in one shade of, of gray and then I'd go in and do all the rendering with a color pencil mm -hmm. and uh, then go back in, add some blacks and stuff to punch it up. You know, it's just. My process hasn't changed that much, honestly, uh, but I, now I just have many more steps, <laughs> you know. But well, you figure stuff out, right? And and, yeah. and uh, the best way to do certain things and get get what you want it to look like. Um, the I, I I came up with this sort of analogy the other day when I was looking through your stuff, and it's you know we were talking earlier about stylization, and I you have this sort of like. <clears throat> um, you know, line decker was was a great painter but he was also such a great stylist you know he had he had his he, he had such a strong sense of style yeah. and um I, I i look at your work that way that it has that sort of angularity to it this sense of style very much like line decker had when comparing to other artists of his era right and um and I, obviously that's, that's a, that's a meant to be a compliment, obviously. And, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that I think helps separate your stuff. I mean, your technique is great, but it's that stylization in your drawing. I think that really makes your stuff more interesting than a lot of people's. It's um, funny. I had, I had never heard of Lion Decker or seen his work until about five years ago. Um, I kept getting really? I got, yeah, people kept telling me my stuff looks like Landecker or Liondecker. And I was like, mm -hmm. who is this guy? You know, eventually I was like, I got I to gotta look this up just to see what they're talking about. Cause it's like the fifth time I've heard that. <laughs> and then I looked it up and then I, I was like, oh, like I really understand. I understand what they mean now. Like it, it's funny that I had never seen it. And yet I was doing things that were so similar to what he did. And uh, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know where I got that from. It's funny. It's just, I just started doing those little chunky kind of square like highlights and stuff. And, and, and it, you know, it, it took ages for me to finally find out what that was all about. Like, who is this guy that I keep getting compared to? And then well, I, you know, know say, great minds think alike, right? For us, you know. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. It, it was, I took it once I saw it, I was like, Oh my God, that's a great compliment. <laughs> oh yeah. I, 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 I discovered him. I don't know, 30 years ago, maybe, you know, I was really early, early nineties kind of thing. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I loved, uh, Norman Rockwell, but Rockwell and Rockwell is, is his own, is a stylist in his own sense, but yeah. it's more realistic. Well, if you and, look at Rockwell's early stuff, you can see the land Decker. Yes. Really yes. And that's yeah. what I, I, that's my favorite Rockwell stuff is the early stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Mine too. But I look at Line Decker and I said, that guy would, if, the, if there had been comic books in the twenties, he would have been a comic book artist because yeah. of the way. Yeah. His, he had the style and the hair, you know, yeah. the way he did hair was very stylized. It wasn't, you know, this beautiful flowing, perfect hair. It was these chunks and shapes. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah, I see yeah. a lot of that 
similarities in uh, your work as well. Is this a is this an older piece here, this Iron Man? Uh, kind of middle, middle in terms of uh, where I was in term in, in my process. It was it's probably around the same time as that Max piece, maybe. Okay. Um, so yeah, well, it's probably about twenty fifteen somewhere around there. That's this is obviously so. Yeah, I was going to say. So you're using marker in here again, and then this is a heavy dose of pro white or uh, acrylic white here for your highlights, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that would be the exact same process as the other ones, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a lot more paint than the the Max probably. No, that's 2012. So yeah, maybe about the same, around the same time as the Max. And uh, yeah, I was I, around this time. I was really starting to feel more comfortable painting, and I was adding more and more, and. Uh, Nowadays, my every square inch of my canvas has got watercolor on it. But at that time, I was leaving a lot of areas untouched from paint. I was basically just doing the highlights. Right. You're like doing a vignette kind of thing, right? In, um, instead of a, like a complete. Yeah. Thing. Nowadays, I, I, I lay the marker down or lay the, the watercolor down because I'll get a texture that I can then color over. So I'll, you'll see that texture show through. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, so even in the deep shadows, I put some paint in there just to get a little bit of a texture. All right, let's take a look at some of your color pieces, and we can answer that question that David had a while ago yeah. um, about how much time you put into one of these pieces. But um, well, let's go ahead. I'll ask you that: How much time do you normally put into a full color piece? And I know size, but all things being equal, because uh, yeah. I think I asked you this. Would you say about a week or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I try to finish a, a, a piece a week or a, it depends. Of course, it depends on what it is. But, you know, um, something, you know, like this, the spawn, it's got a lot. Of, there's a lot of ink involved in this piece. Um, so if you if you're able to see it up close, there's there's ink all over it. So it's not a marker piece per se. It's it's I'm coloring with a marker and I'm doing a ton of painting and, and inking. And uh, it's hard to see in the, this image, but you know, there's, um, there's, it's a fully inked piece too. So um, that's so what I, I was gonna. That's what I was gonna ask you when you're doing your color pieces. And I've got, I've got the Kit Carter piece you did, which we'll look at in a little bit. I've got the original right here, so we'll get it under the camera and ask you a few questions. But uh, do you fully ink these, like those black and white pieces we saw, and then you paint them, or does uh, it depend on the piece? Actually, I ink them after I paint them. Um, I was going to ask you how in the world do you get those blacks so black if you're painting over the top of them, but you're doing <laughs> just the opposite. Yeah. Uh, it depends on what I'm going for, but, uh, sometimes I will ink them first, but in this case, in a lot of cases, I, I want the, I try to, I want to control the black levels and how, and where the lines are. And, and mm -hmm. I, if I'm doing a black and white piece. I don't know yet. I don't know enough. Of, I don't know enough about what it's going to look like to, to make those choices. Yeah. Because a lot of times if you're inking something, you're looking at black and white, you you tend to over render or you're like you're over doing stuff because you don't see the color yet. Right. So if, if I go in and do the lines, I'm going to go way heavier and then I put color on top and now I'm locked into whatever I did on the line side. So right. I gotcha. like to take, I like to color and paint it first and then figure out how to make the lines complement what I've got there. And um, so, so, yeah, it's it's almost always done afterwards. Yeah, OK, this, so on this. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, if I, if uh, probably a, a rough estimate for something like this would be in the 40 hour range, you know, um, that's probably. How many, how many hours can you sit at your desk a day and actually draw? Because I find myself all, if I can sit still for two hours without getting up and moving around, it's a miracle. So I, I mean, I'll work six to eight hours, but it's over. 14 hours you know what i mean because i <laughs> it's hard for me to just like i can't just sit there for six hours and work yeah uh, i'm i I'm, I'm sort of the same way um i can i'm not the sitting part i i get you know i get a little restless sometimes but it's my uh my hand uh, that, mm. is, that gives me the most trouble because i i'm one of those people that makes like a, a tight monkey fist when i'm drawing mm -hmm. really crunch my pencil or my pen you know i ball my <laughs> fist up, you know? <laughs> i'm just you know, and I don't even know I'm doing it until I put my pencil down. I'm like, God, my hand hurts. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you my, feel like, like you got finger indentations in your pencil and pen. Yeah, my um, knuckles, knuckles are tight and everything. So yeah, I, I I do about 
I could do a good six hours a day of, of like real working before my hand mm -hmm. is just killing me and I have to stop. Yeah. If, if I'm doing, um, say, if I'm just painting where I can, my hand's a little lighter, a little looser, mm -hmm. I can, I can maybe do seven or eight without it being too bad. But most of the time there's a pencil or a, a pen in my hand. So I'm six is about all I'm good for. So you're inking with a micron over the top of your colored. Uh, uh, yeah. And when you're laying these blacks in. Yeah. Cause yep. John sort graphics wants to know, is there a brush in there? But you're saying, no, you, you stick all with a pen. Yeah. I, I stick with pen. Um, with marker, it's, uh, it's not too much of a problem. Sometimes the watercolor can be a little finicky. Like when you try to ink on top of the watercolor, it'll. Right. It'll, Cause it picks up the, the tip of the pen will pick up some of the paint. Right. And it's right. It, it can kind of scratch the surface and it stops yep. drawing and stuff. Yeah. The acrylic uh, inking on top of acrylics, not too bad most of the time, but it can mm -hmm. also have those kind of problems where the pen starts giving you a, a jagged line or something. Right. And then you also get an ugly with an acrylic piece, you get that reflective surface where, you know, like you get that ink line kind of reflection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you varnish it, it takes care of that. So. Okay. Um, so you do this piece in pencil, right? Would, um, mm -hmm. and then, are you gonna are you going there and lay down, I don't know, like a green over the whole thing? Yeah. Or a yellow. I, mean, I, I assume you had a green underpainting. Yeah, I did a I this was a marker piece. So I just I went over the whole thing with a green marker, just one green. Like I so I could see the lines through it, but there's like a shade of green there. Mm -hmm. And I, all I'm looking for is just a little bit of surface to paint on. Like it's it's just a a value, a little deep darker value for me to paint on. Well, let me ask you this. It seems to me like using a, I, I, is this an 11 by 17 piece? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wouldn't it, isn't it more efficient to just like lay like a, like a light green watercolor over it easier than doing it with a marker or maybe it isn't? Um, Time wise, I mean. Yeah. I mean, maybe so. Um, I don't even own watercolors other than my, uh, <laughs> other, than, <laughs> other than my white, I don't own any. So, uh, <laughs> um, I, so, uh, yeah. okay I, <laughs> well that would explain that if you don't have any watercolors you're not going to use watercolor yeah um but i you know it's probably something i should try because uh that would be a lot cheaper um <laughs> well, I, would figure, I just figured it'd be easier with a big brush to you know just right. cover the surface in this light green and then you know go for it but yeah, I, no one ever, i'll be the first to tell you i don't know what the hell i'm doing most of the time so it's uh I learn things all the time and a lot of those things might be common sense things that people have always done and always known. I, I, I learned everything the hard way. So it's a, <laughs> it, well, I wouldn't be surprised if you, if you say, you tell me that and I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Jeez, why didn't I ever think of that? that you know, I'm just going to sit here for two hours and just draw it with them. Just fill it in with a marker. Right. You know, that's <laughs> could have done it in five minutes, but no, I wanted to, uh, yeah, uh, leg pick for two dollars. He says, he says, Chris Stevens, did you do any Atari Force art? Now I have to say, this is a joke because I hate Atari Force, not uh, Garcia Lopez's work, but just the whole concept. I think is stupid. So it's it's this running gag on on the show. So I don't think he's actually <laughs> thinks you ever did any Atari Force, unless you did. Say, I'm about to say I don't think I'm old enough to even have been working in comics by then. Uh, that was okay, and so what I do with people on the show that show such incredible disrespect to my guests is I do this. So there we go. We've taken care of leg kick. <laughs> but thank you for the two dollars leg kick. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't get the joke, so I was like, "Man, where does that?" You know, like yeah, where well, did you come from. It, huh? Yeah, we, we've got we've got in, <laughs> in jokes on this show. You just kind of have to. I, I wouldn't do it. Oh, all right, now look at this. This is I just this is the first time I saw this. A lot of your stuff I've seen because I you know I always look at your stuff on Instagram. But I was you know looking for images to bring on this show, and this is the first time I saw this one. Look at that, Judas freaking priest. Okay, so. Um, let's, let's talk about this a little bit. So what did you, did you lay down a blue? Did you lay down a flat, a color in the background before you started uh, this? Yeah, I honestly, it, it was probably orange that I laid down or no, it was, um, it was like a, a light brown beigey kind of color. Okay. 
Yeah, I can see so it. So more akin to what we're seeing on him, maybe on his face here. You can see it in Silver Surfer a lot. There's that when you look at Okay, the, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's showing through quite a bit on that. Um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, back then I did a, did that a lot. I, it would be like a, a beige color that I would use as, because again, it was just a, a, a value to paint on basically. And so I, then are, so is most of this acrylic or are we, is this most, this marker with some acrylic? I mean, uh, this is all marker and, and, and this is all marker. Yeah. Yeah. So now I've never, I've never gone this deep on markers. I use them for sketches and things like that, but you're basically layering marker color over the top of marker, right? Building yeah. this up. Yeah. It's that, it's that beige color. Then my paints. Then I do a, a color. Okay. Well, when you say, hang on a second, slow down. So when you say your paints, yeah. Okay. So we're going to assume that all of this is this brown color that we see on the surfer here. And that guy right there. <laughs> that's the well, that's your pro. That's your pro white, right? Right. Bleed proof white. Yeah. It's it's that's that's all the paint I use on this. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> slow down, big fella. Okay, so. <laughs> Are you saying that you paint, you don't paint over the whole thing with white, do you? After you lay down the I do, brown? Yeah. I do. No, it's, there's, there's just a ton of white on this thing. So you go and, okay, so, all right. So you do the whole background in the tan color, right? And I then the whole, you, the whole piece is, is that color. Yeah. Right. And then you go over that with white. Yeah. And then you start markering over the top of that. Yeah, I did the same with the spawn and, and the other ones too. It's just, uh, yeah, you, you, I put that white down and then when I go over it with color, it just, it, it becomes that color. So it just, you see the texture of the, of the paint and you see the rendering that I did, but the color shows on top. So do you, when you're going in with a white, are you, I mean, this is kind of dumb to say, I guess, because white is a single value. You can't do in different levels of this is whiter than this white, but yeah. are you painting the texture in there? Like you're painting in all the stuff on his face. Are you just laying over like white over everything? Or are you actually going in and painting the shapes in white and then going over it with marker? Does that make sense? I'm, yeah, I do all the, the, the detailing. So like, if you look at his helmet there, you see all these little shapes and stuff, right? It's all painted in with white and, and, you know, uh, washes. There's a lot of washing going on there. Uh, and um but it's all white it's all white yeah and then i go over it with the color and and i i just kind of depending on what it is if it's a if it's like a really hot highlight that i want uh-huh I, I just blend i blend out like a, a lighter color so that you can see that white kind of show through right um so yeah it's it so when i when i'm done painting it, it looks like a mess. You can't, it, it, you don't, you don't, I mean, I used to be really afraid of it. Like I, I, every time I got to that stage of a piece, I'd be like, Oh my God, this is a disaster. You know, like it would just be, I would be like, this is going to be the worst thing ever, you know? And, and eventually I got to the point where I, I was confident enough in, it in the process that I was like, no, 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 this is, this is okay. It's, it, it looks terrible right now, but once I'm done, it, it's going to look okay. <laughs> I, think I, was, I don't know who I was talking. Oh, it was Peter DeSev I was talking about. And it was like, at some point when you're painting, if you don't think you've ruined it, then you know, you're not normal because everybody gets to that point where it just looks horrible. And you're like, what did I do? But you stay <laughs> with it and you work through it and it suddenly becomes something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, let's see here. Uh, the Geek Easy says, wow, I have a new top 10 artist. So I'm sure he's he's probably slotting you in right behind me. Uh, <laughs> joking. Uh, John says, I'm glad that broke Aaron's brain as much as it did mine. <laughs> it's like <laughs> trying to conceptualize what you were doing here and how it made any sense. Yeah. Yeah, because, um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, that process is like, um, you know, um, it's, that's the thing that I think confounds people when they look at my work. Cause then when I answer them, when I try to explain it or I show pictures in the past, I, I think people are just still confused by what it is. I, you know, I sat down with Tim Townsend at a hotel room and just did it. I did a demo for him. Mm -hmm. And um, by the end, I, I, he was just like, I still don't, <laughs> 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 you know, <so laughs> 
So this it's makes like, no sense, Chris. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> so well, yeah, it's where did you get the idea or the the um that laying down white would create a better surface to lay your markers over? I mean, where where did that come from? Well, I, I think it started because I because of the, the pencil, the white pencil, you know. Okay. Uh, I think eventually I started kind of trying to layer marker on top of the pencil. Uh-huh. And occasionally I would, I would go over my highlight. I, sometimes I would put a, a paint highlight on there, just a little bit of a highlight or a texture bumping or something. And then I'd go over that with marker and it just started evolving, you know, and I started doing mm -hmm. more paint and then I started covering that more with marker and it just eventually became the foundation of all of it, you know, where it was just step one, put down some sort of color step two, mm -hmm. do all the paint, you know, and, and cover it pretty much top to bottom with paint and then figure out color afterwards. You know, oh, you're crazy. Just, you're crazy. You're, you're a mad scientist. <laughs> well, um, you know, that's the, it's, it's a very improvisational thing. I do, you know, when I start doing a lot of stuff, I, I don't know where it's going. So it's like, I had no idea what this would look like, you know, like I had a, the green in there. I didn't know I was going to do that. You know, like <laughs> it just, like, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if that was something else originally. Like I colored it one way and I was like, nah, that, nah I got to Cause the cool thing about marker is you can kind of just go over it again and replace that color. You know, it'll, you know, the color underneath will still be there a little bit, but you can change the color of things when you have that paint underneath. That's so, interesting. Cause I, I would never, I, like I said, I've never layered, uh, with markers, I've never used color markers because they're so bright. It scares me. It's like, I like to build up to that intensity. That's why I like using watercolors. Cause I can, I can layer that watercolor till I get to that intense level of, and markers yeah. tend to be so bright coming just right out of the, the shoot that it's always like scared me. Um, so I've never tried to layer color over the top of color with a marker. Um, but obviously it works because you're doing just that, right? Well, I'm the opposite. I can't get the colors bright enough. You know, like I just like, I want the colors to be as intense as possible. Yeah. So, which is one of the reasons why I switched to acrylic because, you know, I, I feel like I'm getting a, a stronger color punch from those than I do. Cause like part of the process here of having that color underneath. And since, since the inks are transparent, that, that color underneath always shows through. So mm -hmm. it's, it's like um, it's hard to get a, a truly pure color out of a marker when you're layering it like that. Right. You put an orange down, it's it's going to be a little muddy because there's a brown or something underneath it. You know, so it's right. so, you know, that that my process has changed a little bit since this. Like, I don't do that anymore where I put a brown down. I'll put a I'll use a brighter. I'll use an orange or something a little brighter so that I can get those stronger saturations out of them. Right. I really want those colors to pop. Right. That's one thing I've noticed about your stuff is it's just, you just have vibrant, exciting colors. Um, for John for $5 says, uh, thank you, John. I'd pay money to see Chris and Kelsey on gray beards at the same time talking and showing off color techniques. David <laughs> wouldn't get anything done though. Um, <laughs> do you, uh, I, I, I may have talked to you about this before, but are you, uh, are you shy about doing stuff like this on camera? Uh, I know some people aren't comfortable doing it. I've never done it on camera before. Um, I don't have a, I haven't, I don't even have like a setup to do it on camera. Uh, I, well, that's, you know, that's right. I did talk to you about it. Like early <laughs> on when you, I think I, I was getting you to do the Kit Carter cover. You were, I was trying to get you to come on this show and you're like, oh, I'm not set up to draw. And I'm like, just, I'll do all the talking. You don't have to be on, you know, you don't have to draw anything. But yeah. we have a draw show called Graybeards. Uh, David Williams, me, Kelsey Shannon, and Gary Martin's on there as well. And and every Wednesday, we basically take a subject and we have a poll. People vote on it, and then we draw uh, live. You know, for like two hours. And Kelsey is does he does these amazing, really fast watercolor. Uh, and you know, David and I are still muddling around in the ink stage, and he's like putting all the <laughs> color down. So, yeah. Um, we would, uh, you know, at some point, if you uh, if you ever get a, a camera set up, we'd love to, <laughs> yeah. love to have you on to do that. You know, yeah, because David Fetch, you know, he asked me a while back to do it, and I really wanted to, but I was like, man, I would, 
I don't even know if I can do a face cam, let alone a, a board, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not into that stuff. So I was, I was kind of intimidated by the whole thing. So do, we, just, do we need to get by you a camera and send it to you for Christmas so you can have the camera, <laughs> so you can hook it up and. Uh... Yeah, maybe so. I, I, I'm a little, I'm a little gun shy about it. I used to be very protective of the process, but I'm not so much anymore. It's, it's, I'm, I used to, I used to be worried that I was just a, a technique. Like people like my work because of the technique and not the art. Um, yeah, I don't but, the know. but you oh. are the technique. I mean, you can take a technique and five different guys are going to do it, look, have it look five different ways. Yeah. It's, it's what you do with it. That's, right. you know, that's, I was, I, I've never really, I mean, I understand some people develop a new, a technique that's, or a technique that's completely their own. And, you know, they don't want to share it or anything, but it's always been, to me, it's like, you can tell me all the technique in the world, but I'm going to draw and I'm going to do it like I'm going to do it. There's no way I can do it like you're doing it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah uh, so it's a weird, thing. like, I know Frazetta uses oils that, that really doesn't mm -hmm. help me much. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. I'm still like a paint like Frazetta, right? Yeah. But I mean, this, it's, it's, this is fascinating What how you're doing this. I mean, it's just... Mm -hmm. uh, so on this one, was your underpainting, was it orange or was it... Uh, did you go with the blue? Uh -huh. Do you remember? It was, I'm going to say orange because it looks like it. you got it all the way back here probably, as well. Probably orange. I, I it's, it's possible I did the background orange and I did him just purple. Mm-hmm worked you know uh just works from there i probably that may be the case because it doesn't look like i'm seeing orange show through on him is uh, this is this more are we into the stage where we're using more acrylics here and less marker or is this still all marker there's no acrylic on that okay that's all marker again yeah it's the same process yeah um and so then so you do your painting and then all this like um the darks and stuff on doom you're laying that in after you're done painting. I I think I inked this first. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, I think I did. Um, well, then how do you, how would you get your how would you get your black so vibrant? How do you how do you I clean would, those up? I would ink it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you're amazingly talented, but you're the most inefficient guy I think I've ever talked to. <laughs> Well, you know, I can afford to be, you know, like I don't have a deadline. That's the beauty That's of commission true. work. You know, it's like uh, if I were really crunched for time, I wouldn't be able to do that kind of stuff. But right now, and, and that wasn't my plan to ink it twice. I, I probably did. Uh, what I probably ended up having to do was going back in and just kind of punching certain areas after I colored it. Right. It got it would get a little soft or a little washed out. Right. That's what I used to do. Would go in and just like hit certain areas the, and yeah. then it would just kind of draw it all out, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that would, that's probably what ended up happening there. Um, it's been a your, little while. Your shapes in the background, your sort of faux mechanical shapes you've got going, are those based on anything or does that just come out of your imagination? That's my attempt to homage Jack Kirby tech. Okay. So uh, it, it is sort of, it, it's just kind of your own thing based yeah. your, uh, let's see, uh, Kirby's, vision through your eye you know how you, you yeah, process I, it I, I, reference, I reference some <laughs> old kirby images with with doom and fantastic four and just found certain things i thought were particularly kind of interesting shape wise mm -hmm. and then i just kind of did my own take on it kirby you know kirby is is one of my favorites too i mean like of course he is but you know he he's um he's the goat. I mean, it's just, I, I love, I love everything he ever did. And I, and the, the older he got, the more I loved his stuff, the weirder his stuff got, the more I loved it. Uh, like the seventies and stuff that people criticize is, is some of my favorite stuff of his. Well, his DC stuff, like the demon and Mr. Miracle, the new God stuff is, he's is good. Yeah. 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 I love it. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> let me ask you, uh, you, you said you were afraid of color for the longest time. That's why you were doing these grayscale things all the time. Yeah. You're afraid kind of to step into color. Did you, um, for example, for me, I read uh, Eiton's book on color theory, and it's sort of like, it's like a math book on color theory, but at least it opened my eyes to an understanding of, you know, like the orange-blue complementary, which obviously you have working here in this picture, uh, and that type of thing. Where... 
how did you get comfortable with color? Did you read something? Did you study something? Did you just, I mean, how did you figure it all out that you to finally yeah. say, you know what, I'm going to go for it in color? It, it, yeah, it, it's like everything else I did. It was kind of just an evolution of slowly discovering what I liked or what mm -hmm. I liked. Like this is complimentary, sort of. I mean, it's it's orange and, and purple, but you know, it's it's like a it's a simple kind of uh, thing that always kind of works. You know, when you do warm and cool colors and you do complimentary. Right. Colors. So you know, that's one of my favorite things is like a blue orange, high you know, scheme. You know, right. Uh, that's my that's my favorite color scheme because it just you can fit so much into it. Yeah, it does. You know, if if I could i'd probably do every piece blue and orange <laughs> <laughs> i do do every piece blue and orange I keep thinking, why does my stuff all look the same <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to really try to add other color you know like maybe do something with green do something you know with other things it's, it's hard to to not do that because it just works and it's it's always effective it's always eye-catching and it's always kind of it, it it simplifies my 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 process of trying trying to figure out how to color something it's you know if i right. keep it if I keep it like a monochrome or if I keep it a two tone, you know, thing, it's, it, I don't have to think as much about the colors. I can just kind of focus on the values and all that good stuff. And, um, uh, and it just kind of works. It's a, it's an easy, it's an easy fix. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. David says that is the best doom mask I've seen in a minute. Thank um, you. I put a lot of, that's... that went through a lot of revisions before I was happy with it. Cause doom is doom is like, one of my favorite characters, but I, I have a real hard time drawing him because he just never looks right when I draw. So I have to, I, I draw, I, I'll redraw his face over and over again. Yeah. That mask is kind of tricky to make it look, I mean, Kirby always made it work like a piece of cake, but you know, you try and yeah. do it and you're like, that looks stupid. I got to dress it up. I got to get something out of this. It but does, It looks stupid. If you try to copy a Kirby design, it doesn't look good. Right. It looks, it looks great when he does it, but it doesn't work when most people do it. <laughs> all right, dude. Are we are we still in marker land here, or are you getting into more paint on this? That's all marker, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same same process. I I, I didn't start painting until pretty recently. I actually, like the okay. last last year is probably when I really started doing a lot of painted stuff. So this I is, love this vibrant, explosive color you got going on here with the uh, with the yeah. explosions. I guess. So that you know, so in that case, I would knowing that it was going to be bright light. I would have, I would have not colored that area. Those, those bursts, I would have left them white so that when I added the orange and yellow, they really popped. Mm -hmm. So, well, but I probably yeah. used the same Brown kind of base color for the whole mm -hmm. thing. You know, probably. Well, you can see it back here in the background a little bit. Right. And then that, and yeah. that's probably sort of where you were at and you got the, uh, excuse me. very nice. And so then you would go over this again, you paint this whole thing in white. And then you start building your marker up over the top of it again. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, there was, there's always a lot of kind of improvising in terms of like the green down there. I probably added that last second. Like I looked at it and said it needed something and I would just add a green to see what it looked like. Because it, that's, the, the cool thing about the technique that I use is that I can change that. I can, if it was blue originally, I could go in and make it green. And if that, that's not working, I can go back to blue. So you, you, a lot of your color stuff is sort of it, very Frazetta-esque in the sense that it's very intuitive, you know, like, uh, and this, I uh, throw a little green in here, you know, and uh, we see that a lot in Frazetta paintings where he's just got yeah. just some bright colors just here and there that don't necessarily, they work, but they don't necessarily make any logical sense. And yet, so you could tell he just put it in there because he kind of felt like it. Right. And I'm kind of getting the idea that that's sort of how you approach yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, Frazetta, of course, is you know a big a big influence color wise, and and I wish I had his his uh, what do you call it his his control in terms of uh, knowing like he 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 could do just a teeny little thing and leave it alone, you know, just like put a little blue in in one spot, and it looks fantastic, and then he just he doesn't do it anywhere else. It's just in that one little right. And it's like, I, I can't do that. Like, I, like if I, if it looks really cool there, it's going to look great everywhere. Right. Like I'm just going to put it, you know, <laughs> I'm just going to start putting, putting like, that. Like a little blip looks really good. I'll put some up here and put some over here. And then suddenly, uh, now the whole piece is blue. It just, I couldn't help it. It was just, you know, I, I don't, I don't have that, 
that control or discipline, I guess, that he did where it was, he knew exactly when to stop. Like, I'm going to put it right there, and it's going to look awesome. Your eye's going to go right to it, and but that's the only spot it's going to be at. Yeah. I don't have that. Uh, uh, let's see. I love that about Frazetta. I tried doing that, but I'm not sure how successful I am at it. I think we're all sort of asked that question every time <laughs> we try it. I don't know if I'm pulling this off. Uh, David Williams says, Chris, would you do a collab piece with another artist? Hint, hint. You know where that's going. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Wait, so you just told me you're like, like your commission list is like uh, two years long right now, right? Is that so? <laughs> yeah, it's, so, it's, yeah. it's really I, I, David is like, if he draws a piece, will you color it kind of thing is what he's talking about. Oh, so he's not coloring my drawing. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I've always wanted to do stuff like that. And I, there's been occasionally an artist that I really like that wants to do it. And I just, haven't haven't been able to because especially these days because it's like i i have to be i have to be making money nowadays <laughs> i know I I, isn't it just, do fun stuff you know yeah but like doing something with with bro would be great you know like uh, his style would be awesome and I, there's been uh you know are you familiar with cheeks sean galloway oh yeah yeah he wanted you know he was like hey man you you should I would love for you to draw, you know, color something of mine. I'm like that'd be really cool to see. You know, I, I'm mm -hmm. curious what that looks like, but I just have never been able to do stuff. Well, working with David's not doesn't. It's not as good as it sounds. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm kidding. The, the I'm work kidding. Is, I love David. The work is worth it, though. You know, like his his stuff is awesome. So I would, it is I would, okay. But, now this. This is what I'm talking about in terms of stylized anatomy and stuff. Yeah, I just I, I love this piece. But <laughs> do you do you when you draw something like this? Do you do you consciously make a decision and say, you know what, I'm going to stretch Spider-Man a little bit here, and because he's you know he's a kind of a wonky character, and see what I can yeah. get away with, or does it? Do you just draw it, and that's just kind of how it comes out? Is there yeah, any I, thought process to to messing with his anatomy at all? With Spider-Man, definitely. I, I, I try okay. to. I try to go really weird with him when I can. Mm -hmm. This one's probably the most extreme of all my Spider-Man. I mean, I really, I, I think I did a, a gesture drawing that was just all out of proportion. And then I just went with it because I was just like, I want to see what this looks like. It's yeah. really, it's really janky, but it, it's, it, it because it's Spider-Man, it, it's not too bad, but you can probably tell this is not a marker piece. I was going to say this, now <laughs> we're getting into paint here. Look at that, right? That is definitely not marker. No. Uh, so this is, is this all acrylic then? This is an oil painting. The, oh, <laughs> I went through an oil like painting. Whatever, so. Chris, whatever you got sitting next <laughs> to the table, huh? Um, so this is all oils. Yeah. I had a period where I was really in love with oils and I started offering it as an option for commissions. And uh, a few, I did, a, I ended up doing a handful of commissions this way. Um, it became in, in, impractical because of right. just the times and all that stuff with yeah, oil. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, for a period there, I was just so enamored with oil that I wanted to do everything like that. And uh, this is just one of the few commissions that came out of that. Well, you know what I think is cool about this is the fact that you're, you're approaching this the same way you would with a marker, um, stylistically wise, because you start a lot of times when you start messing with other mediums, you start thinking, well, OK, I've got to blend it this way or I've got to do it this way. And but this this looks stylistically like consistent with, with what you're doing with the markers, which is really cool, um, because yeah. I think if you correct me if I'm wrong, but if you go in and, and approach this like I'm going to do it the same way I've done everything else, I'm just going to do it with oils. Um, it, it's not as scary, maybe. You know, yeah, trying a new medium or is it <laughs> you're scary, scary no matter what, right? I think it's just the way your my your brain is wired, you know. Like uh, I can't think any other way, and and so when I'm putting the stuff down, I'm I'm working on it until it looks the way I feel like it should, and right. So it, so it ends up looking like everything else I do. <laughs> right, but so, yeah. but you can tell though. I mean, you still got the brushiness in there that, uh, especially in the background, like the you know the flame back here and yeah. the sky back here. You can you, this. This is really obvious uh, now looking at it that that's oil. Uh, this in here, you could fool me into thinking that you you know had done some marker here until yeah. you get this big you know streak <laughs> brush stroke here. 
that was uh, me very trying, painterly. That was me trying to be expressive, like uh, <laughs> my version of it. it. You know, I have that brain that just I have to keep going until it looks exactly the way it should in my head. Right. I can't do an expressive like stroke and that's that's rough or whatever and just leave it. You know, like I right. can't just walk away from that. Unfortunately, I wish I could, but I, my brain just doesn't work that way. I have to I have to fix it. Like no, it's not quite. And then I, I go back in and I keep working on it until it I over render it. So um, you have a you have a combination here. Are you using? I mean, a lot of this stuff like on this leg back here looks like it's very thin. Where um, you know this stuff up here, like this this yellow and red on, on his back, this highlight uh, or kicker light is very thick, and these obviously are, are thick brush strokes here. So, are you messing around with? Oh, I'm going to use a little thinner here, or you know, like linseed oil or something, and then on the other stuff, I'm going to just you know right out of the tube. Or how do you? Yeah, very much so. Ahead. Yeah, I was I was trying to trying to work as loosely as I could. So, I, you know, like an underpainting, I would try, I wanted that underpainting to show, uh, or at least be, be somewhat there, you know, and I try, I try to approach it a little differently than I would any other medium. You know, I, was, I wanted the oils to really shine and, uh, you know, but you know, that, that need to fix, but, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's there. You know? Like you can see, <laughs> You can see, like you were talking about, you know, there's there's little areas where I I managed to hold back, you know, like I managed to leave, like his leg, that lower leg is is not perfect, and I actually left it alone. <laughs> well, you know, but that's at the Frazetta thing, right? Where it's like, you know, yeah. you don't need to be looking at his back leg down here at the bottom of the panel, so it can be washed out or cloudy or whatever, and and then the the stuff that you want people looking at is more bright and focused and sharper. Absolutely, um, you know that's that's what makes his painting so special is that he very carefully chooses what he's going to render to a certain you know completion right and then the rest of it could be really loose and then what happens is your eye goes right to that rendered area where it's really clean and crisp and it makes it jump off the page or the, or the mm -hmm. board, you know? <clears throat> i've always i've been i've been chasing that effect for years because i i can't i can't do that i can't leave it alone i have to do the whole thing I got a whole canvas. I got to got to finish. You know, I think I think what helps is one of the things we were talking about graybeards earlier uh, is when we're trying to finish something in like two hours and you're starting to get you know you're starting to color it with either marker or paint or whatever we happen to be using, you start to like okay I can't do this so you just kind of scribble it and you move on to the stuff that's more important and you almost by default because you have to get it done in two hours or at least that's the goal on the show that you start doing stuff like that it forces you to do stuff like that because you don't have time to render the crap out of everything right and so it's actually a really good exercise for mm -hmm. you know speed painting or speed drawing is a really good exercise to kind of help you get past that sort of i got to render the crap out of everything um and you can kind of discover these other ways that you can approach stuff um, but I, I just, I'm, I'm so, um, in awe of how you're handling all these different mediums, uh, so adeptly. And they're just, it's like, you know what you're doing, Chris. And I know you'd probably be the first one to say you have no idea what you're doing, but it really looks like, you know, what you're doing and all these different things, uh, despite your, your, uh, crazy techniques for getting there. It just, it all just works really well. And, uh, this is just tremendous looking stuff, man. I appreciate that. And man. I'm like David. I, I hate you more than I did before. <laughs> um, let's let's take a look at the uh, my Kit Carter painting you did for me, because I wasn't sure when I when you sent me the scan, I wasn't sure what I was looking at in terms of uh, mediums that you're using. And when I looked at the the finished piece, I'm going to switch cameras here so we can see it better. Um, I was stunned at how flat it was. Cause I was expecting all this texture on there that, you know, you'd done all this wild painting or whatever. And yeah. it was like, it almost looked like it was printed, you know, it was some of the areas were so flat. And um, so let's, let's, uh, let's get into this here a little like bit. It's, it's kind of the result of marker too. It's just, just, they right. are pretty soaking through the paper. So it does look pretty flat. Although this, this piece uh, is kind of like uh, some of the other ones I've done recently where i have started using color pencil to help punch colors a little bit 
Um, so this one is one of the few, one of the first where I really started kind of helping my colors along with color pencil because you know that color pencil sits right on the surface, so you get some nice saturation out of those. Right. So I, but I but I do my best to blend them in, so it's not like an obvious color pencil texture sitting on the surface. Well, I'm not crazy. I uh, knew I when I looked at the back, I knew I had there was plenty of marker on here. Yeah, yeah. I, that's how marker bleeds through on the back, right? So I knew. Uh, but so this is all, I mean, that these highlights obviously are either your white out or your acrylic, right? But this is, is this mostly marker then, except for like the highlighted areas here, the obvious little thick where you went in with paint? Yeah, it's the, it's the same process. It's the, you know, I probably... I can't remember what I did as an underpainting. I think I did an orange underpainting on the whole thing. Um, or you know, I call it an underpainting, but it, I put down ink. I, I colored it orange. And um, then I went in, did my painting, my white painting, and then just started layering color on top of that. And so, you know, any pretty much any of the of the details that you see, any any sort of folds or bumps or any of that stuff, that's that's probably white paint showing through the the marker. Um, like this, like the highlights here. I got these yellow highlights on this rock yeah. outgrowth here. So, so that's white, that, that's white, that's white with just some color over the top of it. With, with a yellow marker on top. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So you did. Yeah. Okay. So I was wondering if you'd like that was a streak of acrylic paint. Uh, but okay. No, I, I get it. Sometimes the color here is fantastic. This. This kind of peach, pink, purple, blue yeah. thing we got going on here, and all this sort of uh, alien world type stuff is just is yeah, really, really imaginative. Um, yeah, I was really going for that sunrise kind of lighting, where the you know the sun's just really hitting certain things real hard. Um, I was just going for a, a nice contrast of that. I knew the background was going to be cool and and dark, you know, so I wanted the the foreground to the pop real nice and the green was like that's another case of me just going i think it was originally blue and i just said man this doesn't that doesn't look good you know so i changed it to green and, and it, i was really happy with that so it, that's how it ended up but it is a lot of times it is that thing where i, I don't i don't really know where i'm going sometimes <laughs> a lot right. of times yeah <laughs> fix it or at least eventually you can get there and fix it i just i thought yeah. the the color in here was just it was just electric and the uh, the shapes and the stuff is really imaginative and alien looking, um, which it's really hard uh, for me. I don't really think outside the box all that well. Um, yeah. So when I see stuff like this, it's just you know like this weird whatever that is and <laughs> thing. And, you know, it's like it's clearly like some alien stuff going on, and just to have the imagination to kind of come up with that, you put little. Uh, Little dinosaur, you know, pteranodons <laughs> or something kind of back here flying around. And uh, that's, my, that's my homage to Frazetta right there because he would always go. have some sort of pterodon flying around. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is freaking awesome. And so the stars and stuff, obviously, you meticulously put in, put those in with a, a brush, right? Do, 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 do. This is not like I got a, I got my toothbrush out and sprayed. That was I think I used a jelly roll. Oh, okay. The, Jelly roll pens. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably, I think that's what I used. From yeah, different, I, you got the pink in here and the blue, and so you used like that color of pen to go in and. Uh, well, no, I think I actually, I, I think I, well, hmm. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll never know. Um, <laughs> we'll we'll never know. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, now, okay. This right here, this texture. This is with a brush and watercolor, right? Or is yeah. it? It's not marker, is it? No. Well, it's uh, it's a watercolor, and then I went back in with a with marker and kind of accentuated it a little bit, you know, to kind yeah. of give it a bit more of a, a punchy texture and help with the transition and all that stuff. Yeah, you can't you cannot appreciate the meticulousness of your work. Without, I mean, when you hold it, when you hold an original in your hand like this, and you can look at it, you just go, "God, this guy's insane." Um, just the uh, the level of detail and the level of, um, well, again, I just said a meticulous approach to the work. Um, it's it's just remarkable. 
So yeah, this is uh, the only thing I'm mad about is that you didn't trim this. So now it's like <laughs> I face the the. Do I trim his original? <laughs> or you know? I yeah. I don't. I don't. I guess I. I guess I didn't want it to be too small. I, <laughs> well, yeah. I was. I was hoping. You know. I probably, should have, I probably should have inked it black or something. I don't know. I don't know. It's like, uh, so I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to stick it in a portfolio for now, but I got to, this got to go up my wall eventually. So I'm going to have to trim this a little bit. <laughs> Matt. So, um, you know, people at home, don't get mad at me. I won't, I won't cut into the artwork, but you know, just down maybe a little bit here so we can put a mat on there and it'll fit. Unless I go for a super big, thick mat all the way around, but that'll diminish the art. See? So yeah, I had, I had a pinch piece that I had to trim because he did the same thing to me. So I, who did that? David Finch. Oh, okay. And he, he did like, he did like this huge, left this huge white area on the bottom of the paper. And I'm like, dude, how am I supposed to frame this? You know? So I, uh, I reluctantly trimmed off the extra. Well, he's so probably like, he may be like me and just doesn't, doesn't picture your stuff being framed. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I have respect for you guys' artwork. Yeah. I'm going to frame it. Gosh darn it. Appreciate that. Um, like, anyway, that's this, incredible. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you like it. I'm really happy you're 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 happy. Um, Everybody's happy, Chris, and that's the way we want to keep it. Um, yeah. Let that's me uh, let me show everybody what um, what this campaign. I mean, most people probably have already seen it, but I'm going to show it anyway. Um, this is what. I was originally going to have Chris do a. Uh, wait a minute, I'm on the wrong screen. I was originally going to have Chris do like a Wraith of God cover, but I really kind of felt like um, I, I was going to get you. When I decided to do Kit Carter, I said I was going to get you on this because I thought you would really bring some vibrant color. And I, I, if you did Wraith of God, it'd be like 90% black. You know what I mean? And it's like with the cape and everything. And it's like, I wanted, I wanted some of your color. Trust and me, I thought would, this might be the not, way to get there. If I did it, it wouldn't be black. Trust me. It would be blue. Okay. And orange. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have done it. You know, that, that car, that's a cool character. It's a cool setting. It's a cool story. You know, I, well, so I, Chris, I, there's another one coming. So we'll talk again. About okay. Okay. Well, th I do yeah. think it worked out well with Kit Carter. It's it's it gave me an opportunity to do uh, an homage, you know, to that you know sci-fi fantasy genre and do something fun with it. And yeah, and I, I was yeah, I was, I was glad you were able to squeeze me in. Um, so this is this is the on the campaign. This is the hardcover. This is by me and Kelsey Shannon did the colors. Uh, normally I color my own covers, but I was trying to get this campaign together and I was in a rush. And so I said, Kelsey, color this, help me. Of course, he did a great job. Excellent looks colorist. Looks and here is uh, the soft cover, the regular edition. It's going to have Chris's cover on it. And this is how it's mocked up. So that's kind of, it really kind of looks like a, a, a pulp is, magazine, which is this, what I really wanted it to look like. This, is this the main cover? Like this? Yes. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. I wasn't sure what you were doing with it. I thought he's maybe like, "Oh, I got to charge him more now." I didn't realize he was using it for the main cover. <laughs> no, um, I'm just, I'm really flattered. I had no idea it was going to be used for like the main. Well, I had I had two choices. I was thinking about using yours for the hard cover, but then I would have had to ship all the books to you and pay you to sign them all, and then it'd be like a pain in the butt. So I said, you know what? I'll make mine the limited edition hard cover, and I'll make Chris's the regular, you know, soft cover trade edition. Okay. So um, not because you liked it. Okay. So <laughs> there was a practical reason for it, okay. but uh, I'm I'm thrilled with it. I just think it looks great, and um, yeah, looks, I always like with the, the the treatment looks it looks really good with the treatment. Thank you. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you're approving of it as well because I was uh, I had I, I was messing around. I had somebody do the logo for me and kind of explain what I was going for, and I I got exactly what I wanted, and um, but um, this is going to be eight and a half by 11. So it's going to be uh, the Marv old Marvel style, eighties graphic novel, novel style. So it's bigger format yep. than, um, than a comic book. Yeah. And uh, here's some of the interiors 
Uh, this is page one with our Lava Man, and there's pages two and three. I just got the colored version of this from Kelsey, so I'm going to put that up in here so you guys can see. Uh, that's Pencils by Me, Inks by Matt Ryan, and the colors will be Kelsey Shannon. Uh, that's Gary Martin did a, a, a piece for the book uh, based on uh, one of the Frazetta Buck Rogers covers. Sure, yeah, that's great. I had a cover here. This was originally going to be the cover, but I just thought uh, Kit looked a little too posed. So, um, so it's going to go. She has a little chest. That? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's a given with me, but, uh, so this will be inside the hardcover edition. Um, we're going to have, I'm going to have a gallery and there are about six to eight pages, probably eight pages of material that'll be in the hardcover. That's not going to be in the soft cover. Um, we have t-shirts, there's Kit and Merv, um, sketchbook uh, it's going to be a full color eight and a half by 11 uh, kit carter sketchbook with all my stuff over the years is that a, um, what's that from that image is that from a from a page or that? this one yeah this from my sketchbook is the very first uh drawing i did of kit carter it was i was trying to come up with kind of like a interesting print to sell at shows and so i thought well what if i did this b movies sort of 50s bubble helmet sci-fi girl <laughs> and it was and it was titled kit carter versus the astro zombies nice. and so i did the 11 by 17 full color print of this but this is the actual first pencil drawing i did in my book uh when i conceptualized the thing and you can obviously see the rights and influence here oh, you sure can it's fantastic um, i really like that image thank you you're, um, you're writing what you like to draw and that's the best way to i mean well that's the only way to go you know you you, yep. you write for your art you know what's going to be good what you're good at drawing, what you like drawing. And, and it always ends up being the best stuff. Um, I'm doing a uh, insert movie poster as well, which I'm going to paint. And uh, this is the color rough I did for it. Um, and this is going to be 34 by, um, oh, let me try that again, 14 by 36. With the old style um, insert wow. movie posters. Yeah, yeah. Um, see cool. our little PG rating down there. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So this is something you'll be able to get in the campaign. Of course, this will be a finished painting, not a color rough, but you um, acrylics on it. Or? Yeah, we got Kit Carter shot glasses, laser etched, uh, all the add ons, garbage man trade paperback. There's some more rights and influence if you've ever seen it. Oh, yeah. And uh, my Power Cube books are both available in trades uh, in the campaign. Uh, Wraith of God number one, the second printing, you can add that on. And then, of course, all the. Uh, uh, Wraith of God books that are coming in this week from the printer and going ship shipping out. But if you missed that campaign and want to get these, you can add those onto your orders as well. Um, someone asked me earlier, which of these covers was my favorite that I did, I assume, because uh, I love the Bisley one, obviously. But out of the three, I I'll, I like the wraparound cover the best. Um, there's a little Tales of Suspense tribute here in the Tomb of Dracula tribute. Um, when I do multiple covers, I try to make them as different as possible rather than just sort of kind of the same thing in a different light. Um, wasn't, there so, another, wasn't there another one? Wasn't there like just, an homage to 70, 70s Marvels covers? Didn't well, that was it? the first campaign. Oh, okay. This is the Those are all sold out. So I ended oh. up doing a second printing, and this is the new cover for the second printing of number okay. one. I got but you. yeah, I did like that 1972 yeah. box it's like cover. A Gil Kane, kind Gil of a Gil Kane thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was great. Yeah, yeah those are all all gone uh oh, that's good that's a good problem <laughs> yeah exactly so anyway guys this is the campaign and you'll find the um the link in the description of this video so you can go right there and back this if you uh, would like and also you'll find the uh the link to uh chris's instagram page um there as well so you can follow him because he's constantly posting really cool art and that's the best way to see it i would guess right because you're not on uh you're not anyplace else. You're just on Instagram, right? Or am I wrong on that? I have I have a, a Facebook community page or whatever it's called. Oh, uh, you do? Okay. So I don't so like the art of Chris Stevens or Chris Stevens art. What's it called? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that shows you how much I keep up with it. I forget. Well, wait a minute. Is someone else doing it for you or are you doing it? My wife does kind of maintain it oh. for me. Uh, All right. But to, you, it doesn't get asked. <laughs> you ask her what it's <laughs> called and you tell me. And... 
it doesn't get updated nearly as much as my Instagram does that. So if you want to kind of follow me, that's the best place. Cause I, I keep up on that pretty good. Yeah. And, that's uh, what I figured your Instagram was probably your best. Well, that's yeah. what I got. And there's a link for that. Uh, Koran Kaiser stones is off to drop some kit Carter stuff for you. Aaron seems fun. Do it, man. Because, uh, the more people I can talk into doing free art to go in that gallery section, the less work I have to do. Um, <laughs> so yeah, do something up for me, man. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Um, okay, Chris, one thing that um, I always do on this show is we look at um, cryptid videos. And uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to make you suffer through some of these videos before I let you go. <laughs> Wait, are, now, before, before we do yeah. that, are you a, a believer? Or is this purely uh, to make fun of the stuff or what is it? No, I was going to ask you that question because let me put it this way. I want to believe, but I am very skeptical. So mm -hmm. uh, where are you at on this stuff? Like Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster, you have any, you've got to have an opinion on this stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I guess, I guess it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't, I can't say I'm a believer. No, uh, um, I believe, I mean, of course I believe in, aliens because how could there not be aliens out there somewhere well that's a whole nother show right you know I guess <laughs> not cryptozoology that's like you know but, uh, <laughs> but stuff on earth that like really wild stuff on earth that we've never discovered or really seen or found true proof of i i, I don't know if i believe in that but uh it's a cool it's a fun idea i love the idea of it it's a it's kind of a romantic i thought that that stuff still exists or or could be stuff we don't even know is right real is out there uh you know i like the, i like the idea of it but so do i but uh, that's about all i like because a lot of the videos <laughs> i see are you know i kind of grade them on effort and a lot of them these people are not putting in the kind of effort <laughs> they can be putting in to do a fake video but all i have right. a little intro to run so let me run the intro and then we'll take a look at the videos okay Yes, it is not finding Bigfoot because we have yet to find him, Chris. But um, it's a spoiler. It's a spoiler. Yeah. Well, we'll give it a shot, though. Now, this, <laughs> and I, I will preface by saying this the guys in the chat know this, but apparently, uh, one of the excuses for never getting a clear shot of Bigfoot is that he's an interdimensional traveler. So he's always phasing in and out. So you can't ever really get an in focus shot of him. I don't know. Maybe that explains it. <laughs> but uh, we'll, we shall see what we shall see. Now, this, this is good reason, good exp explanation I've, I've ever heard. Yeah. So. Now, this is an this is an incredibly fuzzy shot of uh, or film of the Dog Man allegedly. Now, have you ever heard of the Dog Man, Chris? I don't think I've heard that one. It's kind of like a werewolf, but it's like a, the Wisconsin Dog Man. I guess maybe they're in Michigan too. They're in certain areas that. So well, anyway, you tell me what you think of this. <laughs> I'm laughing already. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, here we go. Here's our uh, dog man video. Uh, as you can see, the shaky, blurry camera is always quite effective. <laughs> um, wait a minute. Something's about to happen here. Hang on. There he is. There he is. Uh, he looks a lot like an ape of some kind. Yeah. Or your friend posing as the dog man when you shoot a blurry <laughs> video. Um, I don't know why someone would look at this and suggest that this is a dog man as opposed to a Bigfoot or anything else because well, when he's walking like, like that, he looks more like Bigfoot. When he's crawling on the ground, he looks more like a right. So maybe this guy's confused about how to portray uh, or have his buddy portray because uh, this to me right here, this looks pretty much like a dude trying to look like a monkey or a, a wolf crawling on the ground as you can see it's very short very blurry you sound like you sound like you've already made your mind that this is i real. well chris <laughs> come on you got to give me a little more than this if you want me to buy in now we've had we've had some good videos on here where it's kind of like you go, yeah I, I, you know what that could be something yeah. <laughs> but this this ain't one of them <laughs> yeah that one's uh yeah we might need a little a little, little bit more on that one. That one. Yeah. Um, Paul Ta now, Paul Taylor, he is our resident biologist. This guy is actually a biologist. And so we <laughs> always take his word. And he says, looks like a guy in a gorilla suit. And so, Paul, uh, we're we're on board with you on that. Um, I, I'm going to go with that. 
F in yeah. the chat says the dog man is from Michigan. So, okay. They want to clear that up. So I'm not putting out false information. Um, but I, I wanted to warm you up with the crap and kind of get to the better stuff. Okay. So we got better, better than that. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it's better than that. <laughs> More compelling evidence than that. Kind yeah. Of. Okay. Now this is interesting. Um, I think the guy's reaction is very telling in this. Uh, what I find interesting about this video is the guy is actually blurry, but the creature is actually in focus. So they kind of reversed it on this one, maybe by accident. So this guy's allegedly wandering around someplace and comes across this cave. And this is what he finds. Um, just watch this right there. Ah. Oh. Oh yeah, and he gets out of there quick. Now, wait, wait. So the camera guy's still there, though. Yeah, he's not scared apparently. <laughs> <laughs> That's classified captures, by the way. I should give credit where credit's due. Um, oh. My issue with this is well, there's a lot of things that are an issue with this, but the guy that ran doesn't look like he's run. I mean, he no, just kind of jogs out of the way. You know, it's like he's not too he's scared. Jumped. He jumped he steps out of frame there, yeah. Yeah, and the cameraman, like you said, is still there. This <laughs> looks like maybe some, some decent Muppetry going on here. There should be much uh, more interesting footage after it cuts away there because you know, right. he's, he's like, coming right out, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, where... Where's the where's he when he's like killing the guy? That's what I want to see. Cameraman, yeah, he's he's in the pocket, he's staying right there. But I do actually think they put a little effort into the costume, so I'm yeah. kind of or the puppet, I kind of like that. So, so there you go. I this is like supposedly in you know someplace in South America, of course, or it could be in some dude's backyard, but <laughs> uh, you're going that's with all puppet. we know. You're going with puppet, I think I am the way that kind of lurches out of there. The arms are too skinny for a suit. You know, it's obviously not a right. Guy, so. so watch how it lurches. It looks kind of, it looks like puppetry. You can watch it here. Oh, yeah. He kind of floats up, doesn't he? Yeah. The, the arms are kind of, you know, see what I mean? It's like they're moving, but they're not really moving. <laughs> well, uh, you know, convincingly. That's, that's certainly, but, a, that's a big step up from the first one, though. Uh, yes, there's some serious effort being put into this, and you've got to give them a little bit of credit for the effort. I Although think, I will say the guy in the foreground that ran, he gets an <laughs> F. He gets an F because he just yeah, he wasn't fully committed to it. I don't think. No, he wasn't. And um, I, you got a high tail out of there, man. If you see that thing, yeah. and it, it was convenient. I mean, this creature is conveniently sleeping right in the mouth of the cave. He's right just there. waiting for you. Yeah. Give me a little bit of effort, you know. But yeah. I do like the 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 puppetry and the costume there. I think not bad, not I bad. Some people good. are saying. That's Nancy Pelosi. Um, Paul Taylor says it's better than the last one, and that's that's what a biologist says, Chris. Yeah. So we're going to – I think he's had, on board with it. I do think the cameraman should have ran away, though. I'd sit there. Yeah, I think you're right. It's kind that's of a, a, a bit of a plot hole. I think so. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll downgrade this to a B. I do like the creature costume and the effort into the puppetry of it all. Yeah, that's good. But you gotta, you got to – you've got to be there at all levels. And I just think the Explorer wasn't scared enough. And your cameraman sitting there just watching it while yeah, his friend runs. He's just eating too much for filming this thing. And it's, yeah. it's a, I'm not, I'm not. <clears throat> all right. Now this is real. What it is, I don't know. And uh, that's why it's always good to have. Now this allegedly is like someplace in the Ukraine or something or someplace like Serbia, I think. Uh, or so they say. Okay. That's always a good, you know, I like stuff like that. Yeah. Here we go. So th this guy's out um, fishing or something in this water reservoir or something. But here we go. Let's take a look at this. I'm already getting Loch Ness vibes from this. It's probably a school of fish or something. Okay. Well, look at that big flop right there. That is what I think is interesting. Is that right there? Well, it's hard to tell the scale, like how big that is. I right. Is that... I I can't understand why the camera is so shaky, but there's definitely something there. It doesn't look like it's a faked video, but you know, I have no clue what it could be. I mean, is this, does this water have whales or? Uh... I don't know. That's the thing. Not knowing where it's at or anything like that. It's hard to, yeah. cause that looks like it could be a big flipper or something. Yeah. Um, 
Because that's that's the that's right there. That's the right there is the thing yeah. where it actually. My first thought was a seal or something because, it, yeah. but, I, but I wasn't sure of the size. I couldn't couldn't quite tell the scale of things. Right. So you're saying that it could be a giant seal, which would then make it a cryptid anyway. <laughs> so I mean, um, yeah, I mean that could be a Godzilla-sized seal for all I know. I mean, I really can't right. tell by the by the shot. I'm not sure how big things are. My guess would be, yeah. I has a hard time staying on the subject, but yeah, he turns away at a bad moment. Yeah, should have stayed there. <laughs> Definitely had a cryptid video kind of quality to it by him turning away there. Well, yeah, that, that's a pretty big wake. You know, something's uh, something's going on there, but more than likely just a some sort of uh, fish. It looks but big. Let's see. Yeah. Um, let's see. A guy is on a crane and he's filming. Saw this one on another channel, says Tarks9. Um, Paul Taylor, our biologist, always looking for a scientific explanation, says, I thought maybe a whale surfacing that got into a bay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Um, and that, that's a good, good guess based on that, I think. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Kelraiser says, looks like it's skiing with that walk, that wake. Is what you're trying to say? <laughs> oh, I see the wake from the water. Looks like <laughs> someone's skiing. Okay. I got you. Um, past master Dan says, Nessie is an eel. The only DNA in the water is eel DNA. So he's refuting the Loch Ness monster and we're not even talking about it. But Pastmaster Dan is like, he's not going to let anybody have any sort of false notions about Nessie. Uh, so Nessie is a, an eel, according to Pastmaster Dan. Um, That's as good a theory as I've heard. I mean, it's. Uh, I think so. Uh, Brian Game says, I've seen big fish at a fishery do that. Scale is important. That's true. Yeah. So. Uh I really couldn't. I really can't tell from this if it's if it's like really far away and it's huge, or if it's kind of close and it's not that big. I can't really tell. Right. Well, I don't think there's anything here that makes me think it's necessarily unnatural. Um, now check this out. Um, this is real too, but real what? I don't know. Um, all right. Now check this out. This is like. Just give it a second here. Um, there, okay. So it starts over here. There's a moment where it splashes out of the water that I think is kind of telling. And so it's moving in over here, and then they fade to black. But here we go. <laughs> we'll do it again. Oh, that was the um, <laughs> Where's the... Okay, there's this... All right, you guys are boring me. Get to the good stuff. Okay, here we go. This is what we wanted. So there it is. Now watch when it flops out of the water here. Now you can't. There's a closer shot right there. Oh, that's a much better shot. Right there. Look at that. It looks like a snake or something, doesn't it? Well. Or a giant. I mean, that's a pretty freaking big whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Uh, first thought was like an orca or something, but like no, you'd see the fin if he was coming up like that. Yeah, I mean, look, look at that rounded. I mean, I thought it was like that. That felt like kind of like a snake body or something, like maybe an eel. But that's a one freaking big eel. If that's what that is, <laughs> these people are in like kayaks. I'd be like, get me the heck out of here because that's not. I don't think that's a manatee. I'm guessing this is probably Florida or someplace, but. Oh yeah. Yeah, based on that open water right there in those trees, I'm just maybe it is. It does look Florida like for sure. Um, boy, hmm. I mean, it could, and the, it could be a manatee. Yeah. <laughs> the people, the one dude was generally scared. It was so funny because the guy was generally scared, you could tell in his voice. He's like, we gotta get out of here. And the and the, the woman he's with going, no, 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 wait, wait, I want to get a better shot. And he's like, let's get out of here. <laughs> All right, what do you guys think? Uh the geek easy says that's my ex-girlfriend. Um Paul Taylor, yeah, I thought it was a killer. Where are you at, Paul? There you are. Yeah, I thought it was a killer whale, too. You think so? Uh Robert Doan's going giant beaver, probably not. Um well, the color of it suggests killer whale uh but uh 
I would think you would have seen a fin or something if he came out that much, maybe. That's that was my feeling. It's like if that was a fish, wouldn't we have caught some sort of but then I thought it's too freaking big to be an eel. Yeah. I mean, look how thick that is right there. <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah. know, maybe, maybe that's his nose, but then you'd see the back fin, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would think so. Or a little bit of white or something. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, if that's his nose right there, you would have seen a fin right here. I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Another mystery yeah. that will go unsolved on this. Uh, it is. It's interesting. But I can tell you this, if it was like a fish that big, even if it wasn't like some monster, but just a fish and I'm in a kayak, I'm getting the heck out of there. Uh, <laughs> anything that's big enough to eat me, I'm not sticking around. Um, <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. Art of Roy. No, he's he's calling. Uh, this film is going backwards. You can tell by the raindrops coming off the water at the beginning. Mm. So you're saying the whole thing is full of uh, shenanigans, chicanery mm. even. Hmm. Let's that see. Sequential it. treasure says it's a kraken, so it could be. That was that was my next guess. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't a killer whale, it's a kraken. All right. Uh, this is one. This is our final one of the day. But this is a uh, snowy Bigfoot. So let's see what we can. Uh... Is that a yeti or is that something else? Well, no. I think it's a regular Bigfoot, but it just happens to be snowing out. Oh, I got you. So here we are in the woods. You can see him back here, or pardon me, right there. And there's kind of different levels of him. You can see him walking back there and he he looks tiny. Yeah, he doesn't look big. Maybe it's little foot. Um yeah, that looks that, like so this guy has the presence of mind to zoom in though. So I give him credit for that. Not super shaky, at least not yet. No, yeah, until we get to the good stuff, then it starts shaking like crazy. <laughs> uh here we go. There now oh, really this is brilliant, <laughs> right? You see him right there, and then you, you <laughs> oh, there's Bigfoot all filmed down here. You know, it's like, what? Uh, yeah, squirrel? I mean, really, like, uh, you got Bigfoot on your camera, man. You yeah. Gotta, you gotta My problem it. here is the, this. There you go. My problem with this is this is a pretty casually walking Bigfoot. There's his back. We don't get to see his face. It's always from behind. Um, the snow look. seems to be real, however. That does look, and it's falling down, so it's not backwards. <laughs> there he is again um i don't know my gut reaction here chris is this is somebody's friend in a suit maybe he couldn't um, afford a mask so he never turns around right and i just the again when i see bigfoot i would expect a little bit more i don't know animalistic walk not like you yeah. know guys Guy's on his way to Walmart or something, you know, on a, on a Sunday like afternoon. Casually stepping around trees like a person would. So it's a, yeah, a, exactly. Not real. You always you always look at their feet if they're step trying not to trip. You're like, yeah, that's a dude. <laughs> that's a but at least it's in focus, right? I give him credit for that, and not too shaky. Yeah, the 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 camera turned down really is upsetting though. When he gets him in sight and then he pulls the camera down, it's like hey, yep, what right you? there. It's like, come on, get back up there, get back up there. And we get a little bit, but see how look at how he's walking. He's not swinging his arms. He's just kind of. I'm not buying it, Chris. I yeah. think, I think someone is trying to fool us, and I'm not going to fall for it. <laughs> <laughs> You might be onto something there, Aaron. Uh. <laughs> Iodine seventy four says he walks like a hipster. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. Fat Samurai says he's walking like he's going to algebra class. <laughs> um, <laughs> hands in his pockets. <laughs> <laughs> that's like the most casual Bigfoot film you'll this ever guy, see. This guy might not have even known he was on camera because he was That's walking. So <laughs> <casually. laughs> that was an outtake. They were they needed. That's to, right. He didn't even. Do it. It. <laughs> he's. I'm gonna go grab lunch. We'll film later. You know, and he's walking off. The guy's still filming. You know. Yeah, that's just oh my gosh. Well, that's what uh, that's what really makes this channel special is our <laughs> is our search for the truth. And um, so there you. <laughs> I think you found some truth today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I want to say, Chris, uh, we've been on for two and a half hours. You're a very good sport hanging in me, hanging in here with me for that long. I and, you made uh, 
you made it very easy for me. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate discussing your your technique and your approach to this stuff. It was just fascinating and confusing at the same time, <laughs> but brilliant work. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart that your work is brilliant. I love it. And um, I just am looking forward to the the time where we, I can uh, get you to do something else for me again. Um, Thank you. I hope I hope the piece helps in some way or. Whatever, I'm whatever. sure it is. I mean, pe people love it. So, um, I yeah, again, very appreciative. Hey, let me ask you something. Before I didn't ask you this before I let you go, um, you we talked about this a little bit off camera, but you haven't done a ton of interiors. You kind of uh, you're more interested in covers and illustration. Is that correct? Yeah, I consider myself an illustrator. Yeah. So, uh, so if someone came to you and said, "Hey, Chris." do this story for me or something. I mean, like Marvel or DC or anybody, is that something you just like, yeah, no, nah, I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road. Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, it's, I, I kind of, I, I guess if I, if I think about like uh, the, the old days of graphic novels are gone, like Marvel and DC don't do like proper graphic novels anymore where they take two years and just make a book. They, I guess they do certain things that are similar to that, but you know, how the old days they used to just make a graphic novel. And, mm -hmm. it was, and that was the only format that it was in. It was just, it was a graphic novel. Okay. And then there's guys like Ar Arthur Adams who would spend a year on one annual issue or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> like Spider-Man annual. I'd have to do something like that because I'm so slow mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm such a pain in the ass and, and just, uh, <laughs> I, just, I just don't oh. think I have that in me to, to, to do what, what you're doing uh, to the level and the, the speed and the quality that you're able to do it. I have so much respect for you guys, like and what you do, like just to, to tell a good story, to get it done as fast as you can and keep the quality level so high. I have so much respect for that. Well, thank you. And uh, so we have, we have a mutual sus respect society. So that's good. I'm glad. Uh, thank you very much. For that. Paul Taylor, $10 Canadian. Interesting show today. Thanks for the insight. I really like the detail on Chris's work, especially the ones in color. Uh, Paul, he refuses to accept anything in black and white. Everything's got to be in color for him. Um, Wizard Sleeves, I know you asked me this earlier. You said, hey, Aaron, what is your favorite Kit Carter cover of the four? I think you mean Wraith of God because there's only two Kit Carter covers. So out of the four Bloodhunters covers, the wraparound one is probably my favorite. Um, uh, if that's what you're referring to. On the first campaign... Probably the regular cover where he's reared back on the horse and the werewolves behind him. Although I did like the Gil Kane 1970s version I did. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, and of course, I had a Dale Keown werewolf cover on that too. So, you know, that's all. <laughs> I got the original art hanging up back there. So uh, oh, any right. of my guest artists are always automatically my favorite. But if you're talking about the ones that I'm doing, th th those would be the ones uh, that I did that would be my favorite if that answers your question. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank again, Chris Stevens for being here and being a part of the show. Um, you guys, thank you in the chat. Uh, we couldn't do the show without you. We really appreciate your participation. I appreciate all the super chats, but your comments and being involved and sticking it out and uh, showing up here every week. Please hit the like and subscribe if you haven't already. And also, once again, a quick reminder, the Kit Carter Planet Doom uh, campaign on Indiegogo. You'll find the link in the description of this video. You can follow that and back, or you can uh, follow the link to uh, Chris's Instagram page and check out all of his wonderful, cool art. And there's plenty of it to see. So you definitely want to be following him if you're not. And uh, so there you go, guys. Until next time, I guess well, next time we'll see you will be Wednesday right here on Graybeards at one o'clock Pacific time. So thank you. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you later.